Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's section on the journey so far on strategic virtual financial reporting workshop for accounting and finance professionals. Uh, today, being Saturday, June 12, 2021, we'll be discussing extensively on accounting for leases in line with the requirements of IFRS 16. And um, all we'll be discussing is to more or less identify the objective of having a standard that talks about how we account for leases. Uh, also, we need to understand what are the features of leases. And um, we also try to introduce ourselves to the paradigm shift as introduced by IFRS 16, as opposed to what we know prior to now, with respect to the requirement of IA 17. Furthermore, we'll be looking at the main features of a lease. We'll be able to define one or two things on, on those terminologies we'll be coming across with respect to lease. We'll try to look at practical scenarios in which we need to identify if a lease exists or any other form of contract is what is in existence. We introduce our concept, uh, ourselves to the concept of right of use assets, ROU assets, as it's been shortened. And we also look at lease liability or lease obligation, as the case may be. And we are going to view from two perspectives perspective where you pay in advance on the lease payments, and perspective where you pay in arrears on the lease payments. Furthermore, we are going to look at the systematic approach similar to the amortized cost approach of allocating the interest that is implicit in the lease, otherwise known as finance charge, how we more or less allocate it over the lease period. We'll further look at the perspective of all this with respect to lessee's accounting. Who is a lessee? Lessee, it seems to be the entity or person that is granted the right of use of an asset over the lease period. We'll further look at situation where there's a sale and lease back and situation where there seems to be a sale, but rather it is not sales and lead back. Rather, it's more or less considered a securitization. Furthermore, we look at presentation requirements of IFRS 16 and we wrap it up with less of accounting, which seems not to have changed significantly from the perspective of IA 17. IFRS 16 tends to replace IA 17, and the material differences or changes lie with the lessee's accounting and not necessarily the lessor accounting. We're going to look at this and we're going to wrap it up with relevant disclosures with respect to IFR 16. And by then, we'll have made justifications to the requirements of IFR 16. Now, before we proceed, I want one or two persons to more or less give expression of the expectations 
before we venture into this discussion. Okay, because I know we are anxious of having to take something out of this, but what is our expectation and what are we trying to take away before I start the session? Over to you guys. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. So basically, I think uh, sometime last year, we have a PWC. I think um, myself and somebody else in my organization, the, my colleague, we actually attended a virtual program on uh, with PWC on uh, IFRS 16 leases. It was, um, it was, about, it was, oh, so brief summary, they will pay for it. But um, when I look at it and I look at the, I, what I took off from it, I, I didn't really take much from it. I just came to realization after that training that there were some differences between IES 17 and IFRS 16 in terms of uh, the book, as you said, the, the books of the Lisi in terms of uh, right of use and some of the consideration they, that you have to look at it. But I think it was not detailed. It was not really detailed. It was just, uh, I expect and I believe based on um, past experiences that this one we take it, this, the study of today, we look at it in detail. And um, I think uh, I'm happy that we're looking at this again because then, I felt like oh my money was actually no it was nowhere. I don't I don't I don't I actually came out to the feeling that the money was not well spent because my expectation was not met as a result of that training. In fact, what I studied under IS 17 on my own, preparing for ICANN, I think I I appreciate that one much, but though I've kind of forgotten most of it now than what I than what I was taught, I mean, in the course of that training that lasted for like uh, four hours or three hours that day. So I expect a more detailed, and it should not be different from what we have actually uh, been, um, been seeing from this our current program. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other one? Oh, thank you very much, sir, for this opportunity. Um, I've actually been trying to lay my hands on these uh, standards, uh, IFRS 16. I've tried to download some articles from Deloitte and PwC. I've read through them, but you know they are rather theoretical because I've not been able to appreciate the practical aspect of it, especially the way you used to uh, teach us how to build models. So that is exactly what I'm expecting today. I want to see it built in Excel and in a way that I can relate to easily. And also, I also want to understand more about the practicality of this standard in uh, certain industries like uh, transport and logistics, maybe telecommunication and real estate. I want to see how the IFRS really affects those uh, important industries that are into leasing of assets. Okay, I know that. My expectation is mainly about the practicality of the, uh, the IFRS and the difference. I mean, by what I mean by practicality is in the real sense of the transaction, the life situation, how we can treat it, you know, like least. I mean, finance lease, like finance lease when a company leases uh, plants and machineries from uh, uh, maybe the company that are selling it. And uh, like the transport case that uh, Mr. Shegun just mentioned, you know, things like that. I want to, I, uh, I'm expectant that uh, we will really delve into the live uh, aspect of this. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, in the absence of anything to the contrary, we can commence the session as follows. Now today we'll be discussing on leases. I five sixteen. Okay, the first thing is for us to identify what is the objective of this standard. Now, when we look at I five sixteen, the primary objective of having this separate standard that will assist us in the whole process of recognizing a lease, measuring and presenting a lease in the financial statements. It's more or less trying to make us appropriately account for a lease in our financial statements with respect to three key things. One, with respect to identification and recognition of a lease transaction, either from the perspective of the lessee or from the perspective of the lessor. Another aspect that it tends to address is how do we measure at initial recognition and subsequently at every reporting date up to the expiration of the lease, a transaction that constitutes a lease. Thirdly, it tends to assist us with regard to how do we present the consequence or consequences of a lease transaction or arrangement in a financial statement as it affects the financial position, the financial performance, and the cash flows of an entity. And that also go hand in hand with the disclosure requirement. Now, what does it tend to do? It's to set out the underlying principles To do what? One, identification and recognition of a lease. Either from the perspective of the lesser or Let's see. Two measurements of an arrangement that does contain a lease. With respect to initial recognition and subsequent measurements up to the expiration of the lease arrangements. And last, presentation and disclosures of information as it affects the 
financial position. Financial performance. And the cash flows of the parties to the lease. Now, this is the underlining objective that we expect to achieve in the course of accounting for a lease in line with the requirements of IFRS 16. Okay, any question before we proceed? Any question on this? Any question before we proceed? Okay. Now, if that is the case, the next order. We need to cross now the next order we need to cross is the future or what I would call the main features of a lease. Now, since IFRS 16 requires us to recognize asset and liabilities that arose from a lease arrangement that exists within the time that is beyond more than a 12 month accounting period. And of which such an asset is not considered of a low value. Therefore, certain key features have to be recognized as follows. One, The rights of use assets. What is this? We are going to discuss that. Now, and this is from the perspective of the lessee. Who is a lessee in a lease? We are going to discuss that after defining what a lease is. Another feature is lease liability or obligation have to be recognized. This are from the perspective of the lessee. Now the next feature is with respect to the lessor and that borders on 
the classification of a lease either as a one finance lease or operating lease. Now, some of us might surprise that we thought it's only IS 17 that dealt with classification and IFR 16 no longer classify. You are partly right, but that is from the perspective of the lessees accounting. There have never been significant changes to the accounting from the perspective of the lessor, which still requires classification of a lease into finance or operating lease. Whereas from the perspective of the lessee, such classification is not required. Why? Because we now adopt a single economic model for a lessee in all kinds of lease or in all kinds of an arrangement that contain a lease. And that single economic model is to recognize a lease asset by way of right of use of an asset, subject to two exceptions, which we are going to consider later. But from the perspective of the lessor, this classification is instrumental at the inception of the lease to determine the appropriate accounting methodology. And this is from the perspective of the lessor. Later on, we ask ourselves, who is the lessor? And who is the lessee? But before we do that, the first thing we need to do is to define what a lease is. What is a lease? Who can assist us now? What is a lease? From your own perspective, what is a lease? Over to you guys. I want to give it a try. Yes, sir. Okay, a lease is an arrangement whereby um, a party conveys the right to use an asset to another party uh, in exchange for consideration without necessarily selling, it, selling the asset outrightly. So that is just my brief definition of Elise arrangement. Who else again? Who again would we'll give a try? Okay, I think I think a lease is um, an agreement between two parties to which an asset, a, 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 the one party, the that is the the lessee, is given the the right to use an asset by the lessor who actually owns the property uh, for a particular period of time. And then um, consideration, financial consideration is actually exchange. I think that is where I look at uh, a lease.
Okay, thank you. This is my network. I'm using to network the uh, either conflicting or having one issue or the other. Okay, um, thank you. Who else before we proceed? Who else? Okay, what is a lease? The first thing is that a lease arose from an arrangement. That means a lease must first of all be considered a contract or in some situation, a part of a contract. Secondly, because it's a contract by nature, it must convey a legal right. To use an asset of another. Party. Now, the asset of another party is what we consider as underlining assets. And this is expected to be in exchange for a consideration. Okay, exchange for a consideration. Now, this right must be specified. And I think, um, let me bring exchange for consideration downwards. Because there's a feature that precedes that. The feature that precedes that is the time in which you have right to use that asset. Okay? It must convey a legal right to use an asset of another party. And that is for a specified period of time. otherwise known as the lease period or lease term. And this must be in exchange for a consideration, which is otherwise known as the lease payments. Now, this feature, in any contract or arrangements, either as a whole or in part, we give or an arrangement or contract that contains a lease. Now, having done that, we need to pick it one by one. What is a contract? Who can tell me what a contract is? I say a contract is an arrangement between two parties which is legally enforceable. Okay, let's speak it from that simple language. An arrangement or agreement between two what parties enforceable in the court of law. 
Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, even though IFRS emphasize on substance over form, but it is critical to know that in today's world, no matter the agreement or arrangement you undertake, once it does not have legal backing, it becomes executory. You may lose value that it tends to arrive at the cause. It's only the court that can give you such maximum protection to realizing your value in case of a breach of a contract. And that is why even in IFRS 15, which is revenue from a contract to customer, before you even talk of revenue or recognizing it at all, you must establish that there is a contract that is legally binding and admissible. The same thing happens under the IFRS 16 list, which means if there's no contract, forget about any other thing, which means there's no basis to do anything. Because per venture, you now need to enforce your right. The only thing that can give you the last resort to enforcing your right is a competent law court. And that's why it is critical to understand that. Once you have a contract, that is when you can even talk about, does it contain a lease? But without a contract, forget it. We can't even talk about what a lease, which means the legal form in the identification of a contract is more critical than the substance. But when we get to recognition and measurement, we can now oversee the substance of such an arrangement. That is for accounting purposes. Okay, that's that. Thank you, Steve, for that. Now, the next thing we want to look at is the legal right you have to use an asset. That asset you are talking about, in full definition, based on the right of use, is what we know as underlining asset. Now, what is the feature of an underlining asset? All because by this definition of a lease, once there is no underlining asset that is separately identified and specified, such would not be considered a contract that contains a lease. Rather, it can be a service contract or any other form of contract. Therefore, the question is, when we say underlining assets, what do we refer to? Underlining assets is an asset that is the subject of a lease. That's number one. Number two is that it is the asset for which the right to use, which is ROU for short, the asset has been provided by a lessor to a lessee. Who can interpret this from? What does it mean by underlining assets? Okay, so my understanding is when you see an underlining asset, definitely when you enter a transaction, there has to be a substance for that transaction. What are you transacting? Um, what, are you, what is the transaction about? So if I enter a transaction now with you for exchange of land, for instance, I want to lease your land, that land becomes the underlying asset. So in that case, that land is the subject of the lease. That is, you can say that is an item in which um, I'm expected to derive economics benefit from. So when he says for which the right to use, 
the asset has been provided by the lessor to the lessee. So the lessee, definitely, the lessor needs to part with the right over that land because I'm paying consideration, going back to our definition of lease, because I'm paying consideration for that asset, the right to use that asset has passed from the owner or from the lessor to myself as the lessee. So it technically means that for the period under which I'm paying my lease obligations, making my lease payments to the lessor as the lessee, I have the right to use that asset in the former grid. Okay, now let me expand it further. Now, what we are looking at here is not necessarily the legal right or contract, but we are looking at the subject matter. The subject matter here is the assets. The asset you are talking about, is it separately identified or is it specified? What does that mean? If I approach a leasing company and as an organization, I don't want to buy vehicle because one, I'm a professional firm. I don't want to be involved in fleet management, uh, managing the driver, managing repairs, managing maintenance, monitoring trackers and all sorts of things. But I just approach a list company to say, for my managers, partners, and executives, we are leasing 10 cars. And these 10 cars is such that you provide us vehicle as at when we need it at any time for us to move around. Okay, which means the vehicle in terms of maintenance, in terms of everything is with the lessor. And in that case, what we are only interested in is that at every point in time, we are provided with vehicles. Okay, in that situation, can we say the 10 vehicles qualify as an underlining asset that is specified in such a lease contract. Who will answer that question? Uh, I, I think is is none is not in that situation because um, the do the the company. That is the lessor we always provide the lessee that benefit to use the vehicle, but it's still within the it is still within the uh, the premises based on that description of the lessor. So, and I think for the other line I said to actually qualify as um, a lease, I think the the vehicle must be in, I think it should be in the custody of the lessee. And um, so that they will be able to, the timing and everything will be under their control. I think that's where I look at it. Okay, what about if the vehicle is in the custody of the lessee? The vehicles are always parked in the premises of the lessee. The driver comes in the morning, takes them up, drop the vehicle, and he can decide to come with another vehicle tomorrow. Yours is that you have a minimum standard of vehicle to say the uh, Toyota Pajero, but you are not specific about this is my own vehicle, Toyota Pajero. Once is that once you come in the morning, your managers are going for meetings, they have to Toyota Pajero taking them up and down. Your partners are going for meetings, going for sessions. Do you say now? They take them mm. home, pack it at home, bring it back, but. By nature, the lessor, which is the company leasing out the car, can always replace at will. But what happens is that there's a minimum standard, which is the Toyota Pajero or of higher grade. We used to say I... there is an underlining asset that is specified. No, 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 no. There is not. Why? Why? Well, the, 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 the asset must be... For that contract and um, for the lease, the asset must be 
specified. The asset must be known and must be, be under the control to a reasonable extent of the lessee. So based on that description you just gave, the control is still within the hands of the lessee. So I don't think it qualifies as a lease. Okay, if I can just add to that, I don't think it qualifies as a lease because the, the lessor still has a significant control over the assets and can decide to change it as it wills for his own benefit. You know, to gain financial benefit from it, he might decide not to use a jeep today and use maybe a saloon or whatever. So to some extent, the lessor still controls uh, which of the assets to be used, then I think it's more or less a contract of service rather than a lease contract. Okay, now let's look at it. What constitutes an underlying asset? Because that is one of the key parameters to identifying whether it's a lease contract or is a service contract. Now can somebody read this? Okay. So he says an entity must where do you, okay. an entity must identify whether a contract contains a lease, which is the case if the contract conveys the right to control the use of an identified asset for a period of time in exchange for con in exchange for consideration. The right to control the use of an identified asset depends on the lessee having one the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefit from the use of the identified asset, the right to direct the use of the identified assets. The right to direct the use of the asset will arise when either the customer has the right to direct how and for what purpose the asset is used during the whole term of usage. Relevant decisions about the use of the assets are predetermined and the customer can operate the asset without the supplier having the right to change those operating instructions or the customer or the customer design the assets in a way that predetermines how and for what purpose the asset will be used throughout the period of use. For example, a piece of factory equipment designed to the specifications of the customer. Even if an asset is specified, the customer does not have the right to direct the use of an identified asset. If the supplier has the substantive right to substitute the assets, through the period of use. Some contracts may contain some elements that are not leases, such as service contracts. This must be separated out from lease and accounted for separately. Thank you very much. We'll come back to this. Now, it's so clear. The first factor you consider is the right of control and which is substantial all. Substantial means not necessarily 100%. 80% is substantial all. 90% is substantial all. You understand? If you substantially control all of the benefits associated with that specified asset, therefore it is, seems to control that asset. In addition to the fact that you have the right to direct the use, but once the lessee, a lessor is the one trying to tell you, you can't use the asset. Okay, I lease assets from you, but you are telling me I can't take it to a good state, the motor vehicle. Therefore, it means you are already restricting me. It means it's more or less a service contract, like Uber. When I call Uber now, you know, I can have an agreement with a particular Uber driver that drive me all day, but it's of such an agreement that the driver would say, okay, if I say I'm going to, but they'll say, no, sir, I can't pass beyond what? Lagos. It then means that the, to direct that use of identified asset is not only within my control, which means these two conditions must be present at all times. Okay, now, what are the practical evidence to show that you actually direct the use of an asset? The first one that comes to being is that you as the customer, which is a lessee, has a direct right 
to say, this is how I'll use the vehicle. And this is the purpose to which I can use it for. Not otherwise, where it is a lessor defining it for me. And another practical evidence of showing that I have the right to direct the use is when I am the one that provided the design to which the lessor presented that asset to suit my demand and my use. Therefore, that is also an evidence that there is a right to use the identified assets. Now, if that is the case, the question then is, if these two conditions are not met, it is more likely that such a contract does not contain a lease. Rather, such a contract may have contained a service or any other form of contract that is not a lease. Which means what is more critical for us is the identification of a lease before we go practically into discussing how do we account for a lease? Does this arrangement by way of contract contains a lease? And that is that for that. Okay. Now, also, the third scenario, you know, the first two scenarios is that a contract contains a lease. The second scenario is that a contract does not contain a lease, but it looks as if it's a lease. The third scenario is that a contract contains a lease and also a service. And if that is the case, you need to separate the lease from the service contract. And account for the lease, the way we will describe is accounting from the perspective of the lessee. And account for the service contract in line with any relevant IFRS that deals with such a transaction. Which means a contract that contains a lease and a service contract is considered a hybrid contract. And such hybrid contract, which is compound in nature, have to be separated into two the lease contract and the service contract. The lease contract will be accounted for in accordance with the requirement of IFRS 16, while the service contract should be accounted for in line with the relevant accounting standards. Does that make a clarity? Is there a clarity? Yes, it does. Huh? Okay. Now I'll share something with you guys. This is a flow chart as contained in the document of IESB. And this flow chart will always guide your thoughts of classifying a lease in practice. Okay, because again, it's not as simple when you get to the borderline between a service contract and a lease contract, whether as those that can be identified separately or those that are considered compound instruments. Okay. Who will proceed with this first? Who will take us through this chart? Okay, let me try. So it says the following flow chart from my FRS 16 may help you in determining whether a contract contains a lease. Firstly, is there an identified asset? That's the first question. That's the first question. What about if the answer is no? If the wow. answer is no, what it means is that the contract does not contain a lease. Okay. So that goes back to what you've said. There must be an identified asset. Now, if there's an identified asset, you move to the next line. Does the customer have the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefit from use of the assets throughout the period of use? So, which means what we've what we're also tried to do here when we were in 16, is just as you had in IFRS 17, which talked about uh, finance lease as being one that transfers substantially all of the um, rights to derive the economic benefits of the asset. So this essentially safely from there, if you ask me. So if the customer does not have the rights, it means that 
the contract does not contain a lease. So which means we've seen the two facts here. One, an asset, an identified asset. And secondly, does the customer have the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefit from the assets throughout the period of use? So I guess this is where we're talking about the right of use. Um, if that is yes, then you consider the third point. Does the customer... The uh, what about if it is no? If it's no, that means it does not contain a lease. Yes. Okay. If it's yes, you ask yourself the third question. The third question, which is, does the customer, the supplier, or neither party have the right to direct how and for what purpose the asset is used throughout the period of use? Now, there are two cases. Whether it's the customer that can direct. No, there are three cases. There are three cases. Okay, sorry. Yes, there are three here. Yeah. So first one is if it is the customer that can direct. So I guess the customer here will mean the lessee. Uh, the lessee, yes, okay. So if the customer can direct how and for what purpose the asset is used throughout the period, then it contains a lease. If however, the supplier, that's the lessor, is still the person that will direct how to use the asset. So it means more like you've bought an asset or you are leasing an asset, but the owner of the asset will still tell you um, where and where to use how, sorry, how to use the asset. So in that case, it does not contain a lease. And then the third one is where neither how and for what purpose the asset will be used is predetermined. Which means, now? Uh, what neither means is that situation will determine whether it is the customer that will determine or is it lesser that will determine. You understand? And that is the borderline where, for example, a condition must, might say that if you are driving within Lagos and Southwest, okay. therefore the, the customer can decide where to go to. But when you are going to cross Southwest because of the volatilities of what is going on, it is now left for you to get the approval of the supplier, which is the lessor, to move beyond Southwest, which means mm. Therefore, it's a situation of where and where do you want to use the assets that will determine who will now be the one to come in to direct the use of the assets. In that situation, you will now ask yourself another question. Go ahead to ask the question. Okay, so in this case, you determine does the customer have the right to upgrade the assets throughout the period of use without the supplier having the right to change those operating conditions? If the answer is yes, then it means it contains a lease. The next question, did the customer design the asset in a way that predetermines how? No, no, if the answer is yes, it contains a lease. But if the answer is no, you ask the final question. That's the final question, okay. So did the customer design the asset in a way that predetermines how and for what purpose the asset will be used throughout the period of use? If the answer is yes, yes, yeah, then there's a lease. There's a lease because it's a customer that even told you this is what I want. Yeah, and you are designing it as a supplier. Okay. Or on behalf of that customer, automatically, okay. is a specified okay. asset. Okay. Therefore, so which means, which means that the customer essentially has designed exactly the way and when I want to use the asset. Them. That's why it's giving you specification. And if it doesn't meet that certification, it's not doing. If it meets, it's doing. Therefore, it means the customer has that right. And that is what I spelled out here. Okay. If you remember. Yeah. That is it. Pre-design. Okay. So the customer and designed the, customer the asset the way that yeah, determines how and for what purpose the and asset will be used. So you've designed that yeah. asset specific to the customer's need. Yeah. Okay, that is that. Any question? Okay, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I think the flow chart is well explained and it's very simple to understand. But what I want to ask is that if, for example, the answer is no, can we say any contract that is not a lease contract is a, is a, is, is, uh, is a service contract. A service contract. Uh, the answer is not necessarily yes, 
but most times it is. It could be any other form of contract. But the situation of that arrangement will determine whether it's a service contract. And I'll give you an example. Like the car I talk about that I lease from a, from a leasing company, 10 cars. You know, it didn't meet the definition of a lease contract. Therefore, it rather meet the definition of a contract of service. And therefore, it will be treated as such from the perspective of the lessee. Does that make sense, sir? Yes. Okay. Now, let me give you a practical scenario. Let us look at practical scenarios and let us see whether you guys have gotten to a level of identifying a lease. Practical scenarios on lease identification. Now let's look at the first one. Okay. Can somebody read and let us see whether we can provide solutions to this. Okay. Um, Coke Town Council has entered into a five-year contract with Carefleet Co. Under which care, so in this case, Coke Town is the lesser, Carefleet is the lessee. Okay, let's start at this. Who is the lessee and lesser? Now, the lessee is who? And the lessee is The lessee is the customer. Yeah. The lessor is the supplier. Now, who is the customer? Finish reading the question before we know who it is. Okay. So it says Coke Town Council has entered into a five year contract with Carefleet Company, under which Carefleet Co supplies, hmm, under which Carefleet Co supplies the council with 10 vehicles for the purpose of community transport. Carefleet Co. owns the relevant vehicles, all 10 of which are specified in the contract. Coke Town Council determines the routes taken for community transport and the charges and eligibility for discount. The council can choose to use the vehicles for purposes other than community transport. When the vehicles are not being used, they are kept at the council's offices and cannot be retrieved by carefully to go unless Coke Town Council defaults on payment. If a vehicle needs to be serviced or repaired, carefully to go is, ob is obliged to provide a temporary replacement vehicle of the same type. Now, the first question is, does this arrangement contain a lease? And that depends on who is the customer in this case? So the customer is Coke Town Council. Coke Town Council. Oh, can cancel, okay. And who is the care fleet? Uh, who is the supplier? Care fleet. Care fleet. Cool. Okay. Now, does this arrangement contain a list? Yes or no, and justify. Who will answer the question?
So I'll say yes, because there's, I can see an underlying asset. I can What's see the that underlying the, asset? The underlying asset is the vehicles, 10 vehicles. 10 vehicles. That means any 10 vehicles on the lining assets, is that what you're saying? No, because they are listed clearly in the contract. How, how are they listed? Where's the evidence? You say relevant. Carefleetco owns the vehicles, all 10 of which are specified in the contract. Relevant and what? Specified. Specified. Which means they will have given you the design of the car, the make, the design, the model, the engine number, the plate number. These are your cars. Not that we are providing you Pajeros of mm. minimum standard. No, these are your cars. Okay, that's one. Second one, who directs the use? Yeah, the customer directs the use because they say the council can choose to use the vehicles for purposes other than community and transport. And it also determines the routes taken for community transport and the charges. Okay. So council determines the route for community okay. transport and charges and eligibility for discounts. Which means it directs the use of the car. Thank you. But there is a problem somewhere here. The vehicle can be replaced temporarily. Would this not contradict the fact that I no longer have access to my specified car because of maintenance and I don't think so. It says that if a vehicle needs to be serviced or repaired, so since this is clearly stated in the contract, if the vehicle needs to be serviced or repaired, is obliged. So uh, carefully, is obliged to provide a temporary replacement vehicle. So it's understandable that is because the main vehicle they've provided needs to be serviced or repaired, they would then provide an alternative. Yeah. Thank you. One, the work temporarily also have signified that this is to ensure that the customer, which is Cope Town, continue to enjoy the substantial economic benefits associated with the lease. With the lease. And okay. that is why. Okay, let us look at what conclusion is there. Can you read the conclusion? Okay, so this is a lease. One, there's an identifiable asset, which are the 10 vehicles that are specified in the contract. Secondly, the council has the right to use the vehicles for the period of the contract. Thirdly, Carefleet Co. does not have the right to substitute any of the vehicles unless they are being serviced or repaired. Therefore, Coke Town Council would need to negotiate to recognize a right of use asset and a lease liability in its financial in its statement of financial position. Thank you. Now I want some else to look at this and analyze it the way Steve has done. This is the second scenario. Can somebody volunteer? And we analyze in a similar manner. The same question will be asked. Who is the AC? Which is the customer? Who is the lessor? The supplier. Okay, who, who can do this for us? Let me read it. So, um, Broke Town Council has recently made substantial cuts to its community transport service. It will now provide such services only in cases of great need. Access the next or, is bad. Oh. And, and now, can you restart again? Your network was bad. Okay. okay. Can you restart? So, Yes, um, I'll start again. Broken Council, I don't know if you can hear me now. Broken Council you. has recently made, okay. Broken Council has recently made substantial cuts to its community transport service. It will now provide such services only in I think cases. Your network, your, network is, your network is breaking. And now your network is breaking. Okay, guys. Okay, somebody can. Oh, I can hear him clearly. Okay, you can continue, and now. Okay. So in case of great need, assess on a case-by-case -case basis. It has entered into a two-year contract with Fleet Car Co. for the use of one in 
one of its mini buses for this purpose. The mini bus must seat 10 people, but Fleet Kako can use any of the 10 seater mini buses where required. The mini buses are held of Fleet Kako's premises and are only made available to Brick Brook Town Council on request. Okay, the Lisi is Brook Town Council and the Lisi. Oh, sorry. Yes, the Lisi is Brook Town Council and the Lesor is Fleet Kako. This is not a lease because, for one, the minibus is in the premises of the Lesor. And also, the mini buses are, are only made available to block that council on request. So it's not a lease, it's a service uh, arrangement, I think. Let me start like this. If you have said that it's not a lead, which means there is no lessee and there is no lessor, rather there is a customer, which okay. is broke down, cancelled, and there is a, a supplier. supplier, which is fleet car. Mm, yes, I think you are right. Now, you first of all said it's not a lease because the asset is not specified. How do you know the asset is not specified? Because these phrases are used one or more of its many buses. Means it is not specified. Um, yes. Assets not specified. That's one. But I may contest with you that saying that the mini bus cannot sit more than 10 people is not a problem. It should not be a determinant to say you don't have control. Because even the maker of the car might have specified maximum of 10 people. Therefore, it's just an additional notification of the instruction that exists in the use of the car. For example, aeroplane has a number of weights. Therefore, even from the maker. Now, if the lessor is not telling you that you can't climb under that weight, that doesn't mean you don't have control, or that doesn't mean it's directing your use, but it's just stating the instruction on the use of that plane from the manufacturer. Therefore, that should not be a factor in this case. Another thing that should not be a factor here is that Mere parking the car in the premises of the supplier might be just for additional security and safety, not necessarily that you have no control over it. And you have no restriction on time or any time or any minute or any hours or purpose to which you can make, you can be granted access upon request to the use of it. Which means these two that you mentioned in addition to these would not necessarily qualify in this substance. But the major factor that has contributed to that is that the asset is not specified because out of the pool, you can always come to pick any of them in that specification. And therefore, I want you to read this as our conclusion. Over to you. You are muted. Okay. Conclusion, this is not a list. There is no identifiable asset. Fleet Co can exchange one minibus for Brokta Council should I... One minibus for Brokta Council. Okay, Dev, okay for, for another. Therefore, Brokta Council should account for the rental payment as an expense in profit or loss. Okay, so can yeah. I paint the scenario? Yeah, can you paint the scenario? Go ahead, sir. Okay, if I have a business premise and uh, I want to 
list out to as many people as possible to put a makeshift uh, shop or kiosk. And um, if I have the uh, power to tell them where exactly they, they can put that uh, makeshift shop, and uh, I can decide to tell them to leave from one place to the other at any time. So which should that constitute um, a lease arrangement or not? Okay, in that case, you don't have the power to direct the use or you don't have full control because the supplier can always come and tell you that, no, move it from here, move it to there. Therefore, it means that in that substance, it does not contain a lease because Though the asset is specified, but you have no control over the asset. Remember that there are two conditions. Asset specified in a contract and you having control to direct the use of that contract towards substantially enjoying the economic benefit of that asset. Does that answer that question? Yes, sir. Okay, let's look at this scenario. Do we look at this scenario and assist us in this case. Okay. Cabal enters into a 10-year contract with a, with a utilities company, tell, tell you, for the right to use three specified physically distinct dark fibers within a large fiber optic cable connecting, connecting North Town to South Town. Cabal makes the decision about the use of the fiber by connecting each end of the fibers to its electronic equipment. That is, Cabal lights the fibers and decides what data and how much data those fibers will transport. If the fibers are damaged, Telnew is responsible for the repair and maintenance. Telnew owns extra fibers, but can substitute those for Cabal's fiber only for reasons of repairs, maintenance, or malfunction, and is obliged to constitute the fibers in three cases. In these cases. Over to you, who is the customer and who is the supplier? Uh, the, the supplier is tell new and the customer is cover. Okay, now can you proceed to explaining whether this arrangement contains a lease or otherwise? Just a moment. Okay, I think it uh, constitutes a lease because uh, there's a statement here that Kaba makes a decision about the use of the fiber by connecting each end of the fiber to his electronic equipment. So it has exclusive authority over uh, the usage of the underlying assets. Okay, let's see whether your position may be correct. Can you go ahead with this? Okay, conclusion. This is a lease. The contract contains a lease of dark fibers. Kabbal has the right to use the three dark fibers for 10 years. There are three identified fibers. The fibers are explicitly specified in the contract and are physically distinct from the other fibers within the cable. Tell new cannot substitute the fibers other than for reasons of repair, maintenance, or malfunction. Cabal has a right to control the use of the fibers throughout the 10 years period, 10 year period of use because A, Cabal has a right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefits from, from use of the fibers over the 10 year period of use and Cabal has exclusive use of the fibers throughout the period of use. B, Cabal has a right to direct the use of the fibers because IFRS 16 paragraph B24 applies. 
One, the customer has the right to direct how and for what purpose the asset is used during the whole of its period of use. Or two, the relevant decisions about use are predetermined and the customer can operate the asset without the, as without the supplier having the right to change other operating instructions. Cabal makes the relevant decisions about how and for what purpose the fibers are used by deciding one when the weather to light when and whether to light the fibers and two when and how much output the fiber will produce that is what data and how much data those fibers will transport cabal has the right to change these decisions during the 10 year period of use Although 10 news decisions about repairing and maintaining the fibers are essential to their efficient use, those decisions do not give Telview, tell new the those decisions, sorry, I, I've lost myself. Those decisions do not give tell new the right to direct how and for what purpose the fibers are used. Consequently, tell new does not control the use of the fibers during the period of use. Oh, Thank you. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So, my question is for the release, for us to consider this as a list, is it relevant that the lessor must provide for the repairs and maintenance of the assets during the period of lease? Not necessary. That is not to establish whether control exists or not. Okay. That is secondary based on arrangements. And that okay. arrangement has a role to play in determining your lease payment. If you will want to request the responsibility of repairs and maintenance to the lessor, it then means mm -hmm. that the lessor will increase technically your lease payment. And if yeah. you want to take that up yourself, which means you will negotiate a lower lease payment. Lease payment. Okay. All right. It happens within the uh, aeroplane, uh, what's it called, airline industry. Yeah. Okay. Some lessor, because of the delicacy, because of the nature of aeroplane and the aerospace, they wanted to maintain its stuff themselves so that after you have used it for five years or 10 years in which you have leased it for, and the life of the plane can last for as much as 25 years, they can be able to make use of that plane to another person. That's why they might say, okay, let us take over the repairs and maintenance. Do you understand? Okay. But mm. that is not necessarily going to be significant to determine whether you control or not. All right, thank you. I get what I'm saying now. Yeah, thank you. Okay, but again, judgment also sets in when you are at the borderline. And that is when you look at the economic substance of all of your arrangements to determine whether you really control or not. But when you are in the game, you yourself can vividly say or tell yourself, do I control? Do I not control? It's like in a marriage. If you have, as the husband, if you control the home, it will be obvious to you, except if you are in denial. You can say now. But again, from the theoretical aspect we are viewing it from, it might look dicey. But when it is you that you are there, either as a lessor or as a lessee, you should be able to easily identify who really control, regardless of how you have made the arrangements. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Thanks. OK. Now, therefore, we now have to focus now on on the lessee accounting for a lease. Lessee's accounting for a lease. Which means the most important thing is to identify whether the contract contains a lease not to jump into accounting for what does not contain a list, and you're already accounting for it as a list. Okay, since we have all agreed that we are in a better position to identifying what constitutes a list, the question then is, how do we account for a list in line with the requirements 
of I-560. Now, as I've said earlier, I-516 does not classify a lease either as an operating lease or a finance lease. Strictly from the perspective of the lessee. Remember my language. This is only valid when you are talking from the perspective of the lessee. There is no classification. Rather, a single economic model is adopted, which requires a lessee in a lease arrangement or an arrangement that contain a lease to always recognize its rights of use assets. subject to two exceptions. Subject to two exceptions, which means the single economic model here says that for every lease you enter as a lessee, the only methodology applicable is to recognize your right of use assets, which is recognized as first, an asset, second, as a non-current word, assets, and third, as a separate class of assets, if needed. And I'll explain that later. Which means the issue of operating financing uh, option for a lease does not arise from the angle of the lessee. And who is the lessee? The lessee is a customer who has obtained the right of using an asset from the supplier or the owner or the manufacturer of the assets. Any question? Any question? Please let us contribute. Mm. Any question? OK. Now. Before I go into the single economic model, let us quickly treat the exceptions. The two exceptions to the single economic model I want short term lease that is lease of not more than twelve months and secondly, lease that are considered of no value even though 
it was not specifically defined. under IFRS 16, but guidance by way of principle and judgment were provided and we're going to look at it. Now, what does that mean? What this means is that if you have a lease you, entail, uh, you engage in, even when the asset is fully specified, you have control, you have all of those things, but the lease will not exceed 12 month calendar year. In such a situation, such a lease will not necessarily qualify under the single economic model of right of use of an asset, rather you might treat it by way of expensive over that period. Your expenses over that period. Okay. Secondly, if you have lease of low value, that is, lease of no value may have qualified by way of it contain a lease. You have control and all sorts of things. Okay. It's for more than one year, probably for two, three, four years. But the value involved is, is immaterial to the value of your operation as an entity. Remember, materiality is entity specific. Okay. For example, let me let me say you are a multi-billion dollar company. And because of you don't want to be managing uh, some level of equipment, like let me say office computers or laptops for your staff, you want to focus on your probably your energy business. You are focusing on new uh, what's it called? What do you call it? Alternative energy, okay? Uh, green energy, and you are focusing on research development and some other venture and you also need computer as part of your tools for your staff and you have to lease computers for your staff probably you have under staffs as a techie company energy techie company you lease on that laptops okay the value of the laptop let's say each one is two hundred thousand, or let's say it's three hundred thousand, and you lease hundred or even if it's five hundred thousand, and you list hundred and you have leased it for three years be your lease period. Now, if you look at the entire value of this, it's insignificant to the burden of trying to account for it in its whole real sense of disclosing right of use of an asset, this obligation, doing all sorts of things. Because this is of no value, which speaks to the concept of materiality from the conceptual framework that once you identify material item and distinguish it from immaterial item, those material items are what are necessarily accorded a strict accounting treatment rather than the immaterial item, or because one of the practical objective of financial reporting is the cost benefits of which the cost of reporting transaction in the manner to which it needs to be reported should not outweigh the benefit, otherwise it becomes onerous. And in that case, on the basis of immateriality, strict accounting treatment may be deviated from because of trying to achieve the objective of cost benefit analysis. Now, similarly, in this case, when you list such items that you as an organization from your judgment is considered to be of low value, Therefore, you need not adopt this single economic model of recognizing the right of use of an asset on one side and recognizing the least liability on the other side. Does that make sense? And to more or less buttress my point there, I want somebody to volunteer to read this to support my assertions. 
Over to you. IFRS 16 provides an optional exception for the full requirements of the standard for A, short-term leases. They are leases with a lease term of 12 months or less. This election is made by class of underlying assets. A lease that contains a purchase option cannot be short-term lease. B, low-value leases. These are leases where the underlying asset has a low value when new. This election can be made on a lease by lease basis. IFRS 16 does not give an amount which is considered to be low value. However, it does give an example of items that will be considered to be low value, including tablets and personal computers, small items of office furniture and, and telephones. Additionally, the assessment of whether an underlying asset is of low value is not dependent on the size or circumstances of the lease of the lessee. So different lessees are expected to reach the same conclusion as to whether a particular underlying asset is of low value. An underlying asset qualifies as low value only if two conditions apply. One, the lessee can benefit from using the underlying asset. Two, the underlying asset is not highly dependent on or highly interrelated with other assets. If the entity elects to take the exemption, lease payments are recognized as an expense and on a straight line basis over the lease term or another systematic basis. If more representative of the pattern of the lessees, if more representative of the pattern of the lessees benefits, Okay, we'll come back here. Now, this is how you account for the lease that is an exception to the requirements of the single economic model, which is the right of use of assets. For those that are of short term and for those that are of low value, you rather more or less expense them on a straight line basis over the lease period. And that is the position of the standard. Okay, but apart from this exception, where we have no exception, how do we account for lease that provide the lessee the right of use assets in the lessee's book? from the commencement date of the lease up to the termination date or expiration date of the lease arrangement. Now, before then, there's something I need to emphasize here with respect to short-term lease. A lease that contains a purchase option can never be a short-term lease because once there's a purchase option, what does that mean? After the lease period, you have the right as a lessee, first right of refusal to acquire that asset. That is purely a lease that is considered not of short term because that purchase option has extended the life of that lease arrangement. And therefore, that is an exception to you taking short term lease and as an exception to the single economic model which means in that regard, you must be watchful of that. Now, let's move ahead. How do we do this? Accounting. Let's see his accounting for a lease under the single economic model. At the commencement date,
of a lease. Later on, we'll try to define what the commencement date is. The lessee recognizes these two things. One, it recognizes the lease liability or obligation. And simultaneously recognize the lease assets, which is this case is usually known as the right of use, which is ROU assets. You might have come across that financial statements. And this is synonymous to what you are, might be familiar with with respect to finance lease from the angle of the, let's see, under IA 17, but slightly some measurements, adjustment or differences may arise. Okay, now, when is the commencement date? of a lease? Who can answer that question? When is a lease considered to have commenced? Who can support us here? Well, I believe it should be the date as stated in the contract, in the lease agreements, if you ask me. Because if the Lessor has made the assets available for you to use and all that has been specified in the contract that, oh, from so-so date you will start, then it should be from that date. So even if the lessee has not started using it, it's just like if you have your own assets, which you start depreciating from the date the asset is available for use and not necessarily when you have deployed the assets. Okay, who else? You want to contend with that before I set in? Okay. Uh, in time, in time of lease arrangement, there is something called beneficial uh, owner, beneficial ownership. It is the date that the both lessee and lessor agreed to be the date of where the uh, economic benefits will start to flow to the lessee as agreed as beneficiary ownership date. That is the commencement date. And in simple language. Okay, let's look at these two things. Um, the two people that gave you seems to, to give you from either of these two perspectives, inception of a lease as against commencement of a lease. Now, what is the inception of a lease? Maybe that is where the contract was signed. Okay. Let me try and put something down here. Now, the insertion of a lease is defined as the earliest of the dates of the lease arrangement and the date of commitment by the parties to the principal provision of the lease. Probably this is the date the lease arrangement was signed. Abby? Yes. How does that differ? from the commencement of a lease. Now, in simple term, the commencement of a lease is a date from which the lessee is entitled to exercise its right of use of an asset. And that is synonymous to, this is synonymous to the date the lessor makes the underlining 
assets available for use by the lessee. Which means the position of Nuruddin is more closer to commencement of a lease than the position of Steve, which is more closer to the inception of a lease. But what is much important in the recognition of a lease from the angle of the lessee is the commencement date of the lease. That is a time is said to have measured the value of the lease with respect to recognizing the lease liability and the corresponding lease asset, which is the right of use assets. Now, that would lead us to defining these following terms. And I want us to get familiar with those terminologies because we'll be making use of them extensively in the course of all of our discussions in practical sense. I want somebody to look at this one by one. Right of use assets. Who will volunteer? Right of use assets, an asset that represents a lessee's right to use an underlying asset for the list term. List term, the non cancelable period for which a lessee has a right to use an underlying asset together with both a period cover by an option to extend the lease if the lease if the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise that option and b period cover by an option to terminate the lease if the lessee is reasonably certain not to exercise the option okay now look at it folks the right of this asset is more or less the legal right you have over the asset. And remember the asset is a specified asset over the list term. And what is the list term? The list term may not be equal to the useful life of the asset. In most cases, they are not. And the list term by nature force is for a non cancelable period, which is the minimum period to which you must use the asset. And where you fail to use it, you still pay for it, which make it onerous. And for which you have the right to use an underlying asset together with both the period covered by an option to extend, which means when you have option to renew the right of using the asset after the expiration of the first right. Okay. And this right is such that it's reasonably certain that you as a lessee will renew because you should know better. And a period covered by the option to terminate with means if there's a clause where you can terminate the lease, if it's also reasonably certain that you are not going to exercise that option. Therefore, the period you have defined as a lessee as the minimum period to which you are going to make use of that asset without you canceling it out or the other party canceling it out is your lease term, otherwise also known as a lease period. Okay, in addition to that, the following are also what I wanted to have understanding of. Okay, can you take us through this? Because all of this is what we are going to make use of as time goes on. Interest rates implicit in the lease. The discount rate that at the inception of the lease cost, the discount rate that at the inception of the lease cost the aggregate present value of the lease payments and the unguaranteed residual value to be equal to the sum of the fair value of the underlying assets and any initial direct cost. Let's see incremental borrowing rates. The rates of interest that a lessee would have to pay to borrow over a similar time and with a similar security, the funds necessary to obtain an asset of similar value to the right of user sets 
in a similar economic environment on guaranteed residual value. That portion of the residual value of the underlying asset, the, the realization of which by the lessor is not assured. Okay. We are going to look at this one by one. Now, I'll try to explain this one by one. The lease payments We are looking at this, that the interest rate implicit in a lease is synonymous to our internal rate of return. And is the internal rate of return that equates the present value of the lease payments plus the unguaranteed residual value of the asset after the lease period and equate it to the present value. of the fair value of the assets and any initial direct costs that may have been incurred in the process. I remember these two amounts are already in their present value. Therefore, I'll say this is equal to the fair value of the specified assets or underlining assets plus the initial direct costs as incurred at the inception of the list. And this is the only one we we'll find the present what value of the lease payments plus unguaranteed residual value. Now, the next question we ask is this What constitutes the lease payments. Please, sir, can you just explain the zone guaranteed residual value? Does yes, I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. Therefore, that's why I'm picking it one by one. Okay. I'm picking the lease payment first, and I'll come to this zone guaranteed residual value. Okay, ability to explain the lease payment will make it easier to explain the zone guaranteed residual value. One. The lease payments constitute the fixed payments. That is predefined or predetermined periodic lease amounts payable by the lessee to the lessor. But this we be reduced by the lease incentives. I will explain that. Given by the lessor to the lessee in form of cash incentive, or reimbursables, which means this is a reduction 
fixed payment is reduced by these lease incentives, but is increased by the variable payments. That is dependent on an index or a market metrics or a market metrics. Such as price indices or market range. And lastly, purchase options or what I will call the guaranteed residual value. Given that it is reasonably certain to be exercised. Now, let me break it down one by one. Lease payment as predefined is that I want to make use of this specified asset for five years. Every year, the rent on it is 10 million naira. 10 million naira each year. This is what we call fixed payments. The fixed payment can be even, it can be graduated. Or they say, first year I pay 10 million, second year I pay 12 million, third year I pay 30 million, fourth year and fifth year I pay 15, 15 million. It's still fixed payment because it is pre agreed. Each payment is pre agreed based on amount and time over the list time. That is the list payment. Now, the list incentive, okay, in this case, is a payment that is made by the lessor to the lessee in form of cash. And that might be as a result of the fact that the lessee will have incurred a direct cost in augmenting the assets that is under the lease before it takes a full use of that asset. Or it might not be in form of cash payment, it might be in form of reimbursement on the assumption that the lessor had a cost that would have been incurred or would be incurred on his behalf by the lessee. And such lease incentive will be deemed to be a reduction of the lease payments. We are going to see that in practical sense. Now the third thing, which is an addition to the fixed payments is a variable payment. But take note, not all variable payment or consideration in a lease arrangement will be considered a component of the lease payment. Those variable payment or consideration are those that are strictly dependent on an index. Such index is the index that is benchmarked against the consumer price index, or what you call the general price index to say, yes, you are paying 30 million, but this 10 million is on the premise that within each year or in two, two years time, the current inflation rate or price index has not moved beyond certain range. And if you move beyond certain range, it means the rent or lease payment will be adjusted for the differential. This kind of variable payment is an add-on to the lease payment. But how do we do that? We'll discuss that later. But anyone, any variable payment that is not dependent on either a market index or a market metrics, such as the price indices or such as market rent, such would not be considered a component of fixed payments or lease payments. 
An example of such is what we call the contingent rents, and we're going to discuss that later. That is not going to be added on to the lease payments. Lastly, when there is a purchase option, which means at the inception of the lease, when the contract was being agreed, and the all terms and conditions have been agreed to by both parties, it is stated in the contract that after the lease period, let us say five years, you have the option to buy the asset for so so amount. That so so amount that has been agreed is predefined, and such is what we call a guaranteed residual value in order to allow the asset to fully pass to you as a lessee after the expiration of the lease and after you fulfill that consideration. And that's what we call the guaranteed residual value. Okay, and that is that. And this is only recognized from the angle of the lessee if the lessee is reasonably assured and certain from his own metrics, from his own financial model, from his own uh, perspective that it's more likely that it will exercise than not exercising. Therefore, it will constitute part of the lease payments, which means all of the item in this lease payment comprises of three add-on and one deduction. What are you adding on? You are adding on the fixed payments, the variable payments that is benchmarked on an index, and the purchase option that is reasonably certain, and you deduct your lease incentives. That will now make us to understand and appreciate what we call the unguaranteed residual value. The unguaranteed residual value is the more or less the portion of the residual value of the entire asset or the underlying asset that the realization of which by the lessor is not assured. What does that mean? It means the lessor has said, you pay this amount. And at the end of the expiration, for the asset to pass to you, if you so wish, you pay 10 million naira. Now, 10 million is guaranteed. But you need to also understand that at the expiration of the assets or from your projection as a lessee, the actual residual value or what of that asset after expiration might be 12 million. But in the contract, you and the lessor has agreed to a guaranteed amount of 10 million. It then means the difference between the realizable value of that asset under that condition in five years time of 12 million and the actual amount that I've agreed to be paid of 10 million, the 2 million is the unguaranteed residual value, which is only recognized from the perspective of the lessor, a lessee, if the lessee is reasonably assured that one, he has a purchase option, and two, is more likely going to exercise that option in transferring the asset to itself after the expiration date upon fulfillment of the guaranteed residual value, which is a purchase option price. And that speaks to the fact that the difference between what actually should be the realizable value of an underlying asset after the expiration and what has been agreed to be paid if it falls short, the difference of that 2 million is the unguaranteed residual value. Shagun, does that explain it better? We can't hear you, we can't see you. Shagun, you ask the question. Okay, any other question for us to proceed? Any other question? Okay, you already know what the fair value of an asset is. Okay, and you know what the initial cost may be. Now, let us now look at something here. Let us look at the lease liability. How is that measured?
how is least liability measured? Now, the least liability measured, uh, the least liability is measured as thus. It's measured at the present value of the lease payments not paid at the commencement date. of the lease. That's one. Two. The estimated lease payments not paid at the commencement commencement date of the lease are discounted at the interest rates implicit in a lease in a lease. Now, take notes. Where the interest rates implicit in a lease cannot be reasonably ascertained. The borrowers, that is the lessees, incremental borrowing rates in similar circumstance will be adopted as a surrogate. What does that mean? What it simply means is that if I know my interest rate implicit in a lease, which is the rate that equates the present value of lease payment and unguaranteed residual value to the fair value of specified asset and initial direct cost as incurred, that will be used to discount my lease payments not paid at the commencement date, which may comprise of the fixed payment less the lease incentives add the variable payment that is indexed and add any purchase option, which is a guaranteed residual value to the lessor. Now, if the interest rate implicit in a lease is not readily av available to discount this lease payment, all on the fact that one, you don't have full information, especially with respect to the fair value of the assets, what then you can do in compliance with the requirement of IFR 16 is to embrace the use of the incremental borrowing rates of the lessee. And take note, incremental borrowing rate of the lessee is not the borrowing rate of the lessee, neither is it weighted average cost of borrowing of the lessee, but rather it is a marginal cost of borrowing under similar circumstances, which means if I am to borrow specifically under that condition at that point in time, to be able to buy that asset and be funding the liability later by way of repayment and interest, at what rate will I borrow? 
if I borrow at 8%, which might be different from my current borrowing rate, which might be different from my weighted average cost of capital, which might be different from any other rate, but this is the marginal rate or incremental rate of me borrowing under the current circumstances to which this lease arrangement has been made. Such will be adopted in lieu of the interest rate implicit in a lease. And we're going to see that as we move on. Okay. okay. Uh, Mula, sorry, I have a question. So what you're trying to say is clearly as the lessee today, yes, I may have a borrowing rates which I've used on other transactions, but I will need a borrowing rate that reflects this kind of transaction. To say, yes. okay, what is the borrowing rate for, let's say that lease is for a period of four or five years. I'll confirm what is my borrowing rate for that four years under similar circumstances, in which case, like you said, um, what I'm paying as the lease obligation becomes what my interest will be for that period. What your principal repayment will be. What my, sorry, what my principal repayment will be. And the tenor okay. is synonymous to it's the tenor. synonymous, yeah. So I have to be looking for a tenor at least that is synonymous to the lease term. We can hear you. I said that means I have to be looking for a tenor that is synonymous to the lease term. Exactly. Under current condition, because what you are saying is that instead of me to lease this asset, I'm not you have to money. borrow to buy that asset under that similar condition. How much will I borrow? Okay. So I guess the most important thing there is then that similar condition. Yes. All right. Okay. Any other question? Okay, can somebody read this for us before we proceed? So lease incentives, these are payments, lease incentives, these are payments made by the lessor to the lessee or the reimbursement or assumption by the lessor of cost of the lease. Other variable payments, e.g. that arise due to the level of use of the assets are accounted for as period costs in profit or loss as incurred. After the commencement date, the current amount of the lease liability is increased by interest charges on the outstanding liability and reduced by lease payments made. Now, remember this phrase. This phrase is not in tandem with the phrase of the variable payment we define here. The variable payment we define here must be dependent on index or market metrics such as consumer price index or market rents. But any other variable payment that is not dependent on an index, but is dependent on either based on the level to which you use the assets or based on other conditions other than those separately identified, those variable payments such as contingent rents, such as contingent rent will be expense as incurred, which means expense as incurred is why we treat them as a period cost and not part of cost that will constitute the right of use of assets or constitute a lease liability. Now, after the commencement date, we'll check this later, the liability will be reduced by the lease payment you made, while the liability will be increased by your interest cost. And we're going to see that. Okay, now that is for lease liability. Let us now look at lease assets. Which you usually call the right of use asset. Now, how do we measure our lease assets, which by default should be initially measured at cost? What is the cost of our lease asset? Can somebody look at it and let me explain it?
who will take over the battle here? Okay. The, the right of user set is initially measured at cost, which includes a, the amount of the initial measurement of the lease liability, the present value of lease payment not paid at commencement date, be any lease payment made at or before the commencement date, less any lease incentives received. C, any initial direct cost, e.g. legal cost incurred by the lessee. D, any cost which the lessee will incur for dismantling and removing the underlying asset or restoring the site at the end of the lease term. Subsequently, the right of user set is normally measured at cost, less accumulated depreciation and impairment losses in accordance with the cost model of IES 16, property plant and equipment, and IFRS 16, paragraph, nine, paragraph 29. Okay, in continuation. Over to you, Shagun. Shagun, can I hear you? Yeah, under this model, the right of user set is depreciated from the commencement date to the earlier of the end of its useful life or the end of the lease term. However, if ownership of the underlying asset is expected to be transferred to the lessee at the end of the lease, the right of user set should be depreciated over the useful life of the over, over the useful life of the underlying assets. Alternatively, the right of user set is accounted for in accordance with A, the revaluation model of IS 16. This is optional where the right of user set relates to a class of property, plant, and equipment, which is measured under the revaluation model. And where elected must apply to all right of user sets relating to the class, to that class, or B, the fair value model of IES 40 investment property. This is compulsory if the right of user set meets the definition of investment property and the lessee uses the fair value model for its investment property. Okay. Thank you very much. Now let me pick it one by one. Now, I told you by default, the right of use asset is measured at cost. And I want you to refer to IS 16, where we talk about property, plant, and equipment. You can further watch the video. And this cost comprises of one, the initial lease liability, which we considered earlier here as the present value of the lease payment and the unguaranteed residual value. Okay. Two, in addition to that, any lease payment made before the commencement, less any incentives, Now, what is lease payment made before the commencement? These are payments you made in advance. That is where you make lease payments. In what? In advance. We are going to see those scenarios. That will not constitute part of liability because you have already paid, but it's part of the cost because it's integral to the lease. And you less your lease incentives, as we have said earlier. Plus, any direct cost, such as legal cost in perfecting title by the lessee. Again, this must be considered from the angle of materiality. Somebody asked me a question at a time that cost of registry vehicle should it be capitalized along with the cost of the vehicle? I said, if you are to look at the requirement of IFRS 16, IS 16, you are to capitalize. 
But before you go to a standard, conceptual framework is a starting point to ask you about the concept of materiality. When I bought car for 20 million and to register the car for ownership, for proof of ownership, everything cost me 20,000 naira or 10,000 naira. You are not capitalizing it. Of what material value is it to 20 million? Therefore, in that situation, on the premise of materiality, such will have been expensed rather than wasting your time capitalizing and depreciating it over many years, please. And that's why I tell people, standard is deferred to only after you've met the minimum requirement as specified in the conceptual framework with respect to materiality and some other concepts. Now, that is that. Which means if this legal cost is not material, but legal cost is usually material to a contract because sometimes it's a percentage of the contract. Do you get what I'm saying now? Including stamp duty and all sorts of things, if it's at value. For example, in Nigeria, there are some at value rate that is as much as 6%. Therefore, when you say 6% is not material to the cost of anything, the answer is no, it is actually material. Do you get what I'm saying now? The next one, is this, and this speaks to the requirement of IES 37 with respect to restoration costs, dismantling costs, asset retirement costs, and all sorts of things, which means the cost you have to incur to dismantle the asset after the useful life or the lease time, as the case may be, or the cost to restore the asset to a condition prior to you using the asset, depending on the agreement you have entered with the lessee, or the cost of restoring the asset or associated resources attached to the asset, probably the land to which the asset was situated, in line with environmental regulations and etc. Therefore, these costs are equally going to be capitalized along with the cost of the asset, even though this will not be a component of the lease liability. But rather, it is also a liability that falls under provision, such as the commissioning provision, restoration provision, or asset retirement obligation, in line with the IES 37, not necessarily in line with the lease liability measurement of IES, IFRS 16. And that is what we need to know. Subsequently, sorry, we are sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. That cost of the commissioning or restoring the assets, can you realistically, um, can you be certain about that cost or is it just an estimate uh, that we made based on, I guess, the list times? Okay, if we go by the provision of IS 37, there's a mm. basis of making an estimate. It's an estimate. How can you be reasonably assured or certain? of what the cost will actually be in 10 years time, 15 years time. Mm -hmm. There are many factors that are taken into consideration. And probably when we get to IS 37, we'll discuss it extensively, but it is an right. estimate. But it okay. must be a reasonable estimate. There must be basis and assumption that are reasonable in making such estimates. Okay, okay. And that's why I said the liability recognition of that estimate falls under the requirement of IS 37 and not under the lease liability measurement of IFI 16. Okay. Okay, now the right of use of assets, you can show it, the standard favors you showing it separately from other component of assets, but the standard does not preclude you from showing it within a class of an asset. What am I saying? If you check most financial statements, in the statement of financial position or the balance sheet, you see a separate line we call ROU asset for short, or right of use assets for long, and you see the value. You can equally show it within a class of the assets. What does that mean? If it's a motor vehicle you lease, you could show it under motor vehicle. But when you get to your note to the financial statement, you must be able to distinguish between your leasehold motor vehicle from your free wood 
motor vehicle. But for simplicity and for better understanding, the industry has much more adopted showing it separately as right of use or assets for better appreciation. With that means that the same principle that applies to the class of assets in terms of depreciation under IA 16 or impairment under IA 36 apply extensively to this, which means you are going to depreciate the right of use assets usually on a straight line basis. That is more or less one of the exceptions that probably may exist on the right of use asset or on the I-516. It is less likely that you may depreciate asset under any other methodology on the right of use asset other than on a straight line basis. Okay, and impairment will also be subject, it will be subjected to impairment in line with the provision of IS 36. Okay, and you must take note that the depreciation uh, the, the of the asset is from the period of commencement to the end of the lease term. Okay, that is provided that the asset's useful life is at least equal to the list term or more than the list term. But in extreme situation, I use the word extreme, the useful life of the asset, which is the economic life of an asset, not necessarily the fiscal life, might fall short of the list term. Therefore, the standard recognizes that how can you be depreciating an asset beyond its economic life? Therefore, it means you have to depreciate such an asset at the shorter of the economic life, which is the useful life or the least term. Now, there's a further exception to the rule that instances may equally exist where the least term is four years and the useful life of the asset is six years but you will be required to depreciate the asset over six years rather than over four years. Why? This is only applicable to a situation where you, you as a lessee has the right, you've had a purchase option or you have purchased an option to buy the asset at a guaranteed residual value at the end of the lease period. And it is reasonably certain that such right will be exercised by you as a lessee. In that case, you will no longer depreciate the assets over the list term, but rather over the extended period of the list, which means over the useful life. This similar circumstance also takes form whenever you equally have an option to renew or extend the useful life even when you are not to purchase. And it is reasonably certain that you are more likely going to extend or renew the use of the asset for another lease period. In that case, the standard says you will consider the all period, the first and the second or more that you expect to make use of the asset and you depreciate your asset over that extended period. And that is the position of the standard. Now, the standard also makes us know that it is also in extreme situation that you might decide not to use the cost model subsequently to the commencement date in the measurement of the right of use assets. And this exception is not blanket, but is an exception that should be in tandem with the recognition principle or model you use for assets in similar class that are owned by the business or controlled by the business other than from lease. Example is if the assets that you have leased, okay, you have similar assets that are only owned by you and you measure them at a valued amount in line with IFIS 16. It then presupposes that you may choose such revaluation model for such 
a lease asset. But when you do that, every asset in that class must also be done on revaluation model, which makes us refer to the same discussion we had under IS 16. And furthermore, what if the asset is of a class that qualify as investment property under IS 40, as opposed to owner occupied property under IS 16? In that case, you can equally adopt the fair value model of IS 40. And every investment property within that class must equally be measured at fair value. Okay. And that is that. And by default, if you already have investment property that are only owned and they are measured at fair value model, once you have a right of use of an asset, such option warranty to automatically carry such a right of use asset relating to investment property at fair value model. Does that explain it rightly? Any question contribution or any practical instance to which you can discuss further? Over to you guys. I want us to deliberate more on it. These are practical instances. Hello. No, it is alright because I said you want us to deliberate on something. Yeah. Any question? Any instance to which you want to contribute before we proceed on the next course of action? I think if you ask me, it's just clear that you can't treat lease without also being fully aware of the requirements in. Uh, both are 16 and 40, you know, but we can see uh, if you have a good understanding of those ones, it also helps um, clearly. But um, yeah, I can hear you. I think it will be, um, I, well, for me, I'm waiting for us when we start the calculations part, the part on the, um, the cost and the liability to recognize. So I really think so, yeah. Okay. But we must understand that everything we have discussed has even given us a clue to doing any mathematical operation on it. Of Therefore, course. calculation is not a standalone. The way we Definitely. see it as if, okay, calculation is what I want to see. No, there's nothing like calculation. Definitely. You find out that everything we want to calculate will be premised on the principles we've discussed here. All of the principles we've discussed. Okay, I want to ask a question. Uh, thank you. Okay, what's your question? Okay, what if the underlying asset in this situation is a software uh, that um, a company gives another one. I mean, when you give another company the right to use your software to perform uh, the organization services, will that also, uh, will you, are we going to use the fair value model or the revaluation model? Or no, to put it in another way, what if uh, I'm giving a copyright or a patent, you know, Will all this even fall under uh, under lease? Will will this IFRS address these instances or not? Okay, thank you. That's what I want you to. You know, I like the way you landed because you landed from the point to which I want to put a question across to you. Now, the first thing you need to understand is this. It is a lease when a contract contains an agreement to lease 
or to have a right to use a specified asset. The question then is that in the instance of you having a right to accessing a software in cloud, because it's cloud computing you are talking about. Yes, yes, cloud Therefore, computing. Therefore, um, is there an underlying asset? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Is there an underlying asset? Yeah, it may not be physical, but you know, there is an uh, intangible asset involved. Intangible. Okay, now that goes back to our definition here. Will intangible constitute an underlying asset? Hmm? Let's look at. Let's look at um, our definition here. Now, can you identify the assets? What is the asset in this case? Can you identify it? Let's start from that. Can we start from that? From where exactly? I, do, I don't understand. No, I said, can you identify the asset? Okay. Check. Yes, sir. An underlying asset must be identifiable and specified. Now, can you identify the asset you use to, to compute uh, on the cloud? identify yeah. yeah yes we can identify it even though <laughs> i because oh, i don't know wow. the definition of identification you know no, it's, <laughs> identification is very clear now okay for example i do you even know the server they use when they change the server when they shut down the server when they do all sort of things do you do you even know what is going on yeah of course not of course not that's why you find out that even across the standard, there's no where reference was made for intangibles. Because when somebody provides you access to his intangible, it's more or less of a service contract. Okay. For example, today, some people make use of Oracle Fusion, SAP, uh, what's it called, Sage X3, and mm -hmm. etc. Oracle, uh, Microsoft Dynamics, and is just providing you access to the shared services. Okay. Does that make sense, sir? Yes, sir. Therefore, can you consider that such a contract contains a list? No, no, it won't. Based on this explanation and clarification, it won't. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other question? Okay. Let's look at presentation in the books of the lessee. In the balance sheet of the lessee, you are going to show on one side, which is on the asset side, the right of use of asset. And on the liability side, you are going to show the lease liability. Let me shock you. Nowhere under IFI 16 that requires you to disclose or show this liability and divide it into two components, non current portion and current portion. Which means by default or impliedly, this liability should be considered non current liability in O. If you look strictly under IFI 16. 
But it's similar to us reading Bible. I will just read one verse of the Bible that says, when you see a thief, kill the thief. And we are not look at the whole spirit of the Bible in its totality to see that there are conditions that were there that can never be fulfilled that will ensure that you kill the thief. Which means it's more or less like sometimes you are spoken to in parables. Which means for you to take decision, you have to look at it holistically, not, not cherry picking. Now, when we look at the standard holistically, though IFR 16 does not require such a separation or distinction. But remember the primary standard that this representation of item in the financial statement is IS1. And IS1 has more or less told us that whenever you present financial statement in the order of permanence rather than order of liquidity, it is essential for us to group or classify balance sheet items, be it an asset or liability, into current and non-current. And it's on that premise of IS1 that we are impliedly going to be compelled to always split our least liability into current portion and non-current portion. And on that premise, we we'll reach a conclusion or compromise here that at every instance, regardless of what the position of IFI 16 is, you must and you should recognize or present least liability into the current portion and the non-current portion. And practically, we are going to disclose how do we split into current and non-current portion on this basis that one, the lease payments are paid in areas or the lease payments are paid in what? In advance. And we're going to look at that now. Any other question? Okay, sir. Um, I actually need clarification on like three items here. Um, in practical exam uh, illustration, I have a situation whereby I, I have an office space which we use for rentage, for lease. Okay, but before the signing of the main lease, there is uh, an offer to lease that serves as preconditions to engage in the lease contract itself. Okay, in my offer to lease, if I have a clause there that, okay, for the, uh, for the prospects to come on board, if they want to do any fit out, I have specification for the kind of fit out that I expect of them to do. After I agree on that, then we can now enter into the lease arrangement per se. Now that uh, clause, I want to know, does it, is, does it not uh, contradict fundamental requirements of the lease contract, especially for the fact that lessor is not expected to have control after the arrangement? But that kind of uh, prescription of the kind of fit out that the lessor wants on his property, that's number one. The lessor number wants two, or the lessee? I didn't get it. Lessor, the Who owner of the property. And wants what? The kind of fit out. Maybe the lessor wants the fit out to be carried out using aluminum, not uh, block demarcation. Yes. And what happened? What is the problem of the lessee in that case? Okay. I know. I want to know. You know, it, it is in the offer to lease. But I, I want to know, know. if it is Who not contradictory. Lessor is provision. the supplier. Wait, wait. Lessor is the supplier of the property. Yes. He's the owner of the property. Yes. And he wanted to use aluminium. Therefore, he, and the space is just a large space. 
It will be yes. given to the lessee one after the other, and there will be demarcation yes. based on the square yes. meter each lessee wants yes. to. Yes, what is not the acquire. issue now? What is the issue there? The issue is if lessor can now say, I want this kind of, kind of demarcation, or does it not uh, contradict hey, the... The lessor is the owner of the... Wait, 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 wait. The lessor is the owner of the assets. It's one demarcating. Yes. Therefore, it's not the one demarcating. How does that affect it? The Who is demarcating? The C is the one demarcating. But he has given the standard that this is the kind of demarcation I want. Yes. And therefore, how does that have any factor there? Okay. Okay. I just want to. It doesn't. It doesn't that. change anything. The essence okay. of that is such so that at the time you are no longer using the asset, I won't incur any cost in pulling it down. That's why, I mean. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Therefore, that's not a big deal. Do you okay. get, it's like my house now. Even the person might have demarcated it before you come and it is aluminum. Therefore, it will tell you that you can't use block. The essence of it is to ensure that the asset in a condition that always restore itself to a new use. Well, Ever anybody want to use it. Exactly. Therefore, that should not be an integral part of forming any conclusion. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Then the second one is when there is existing uh, lease arrangements. In a situation, maybe the lease arrangement is five years lease signed by the lessee. But maybe in the second year, the lessee has financial challenge to continue with the lease arrangement. And in the lease agreement, there is no termination clause well uh, defined in the lease agreement. How can that kind of arrangement be possible? Can lessee back out of the arrangement? And even if Lessie back out, will Lessie be entitled to pay for the whole five years that they signed from the initial uh, uh, agreement? Okay, now that is a legal question. You know, that doesn't speak to accounting. And why is that? That is dependent on the kind of contracts that have existed. Do you understand? It is the okay. outcome or expected outcome of such a legal contract that will influence the accounting that will go into it. But again, a lease term, from what we have said, is a non cancelable period to which that lease must run, which means it is implied from that definition that if the lease term is five years, it means it is a non cancelable period of five years, of which if the lessee cancels, it is presumed in that contract that the lessee will have an onerous obligation to fulfill even when it's not in use of it. But the issue of how you now actualize this and pull is based on the legality of that contract and which you can go through the medium of arbitration, mediation, or courts. You can say now. But our okay. own perspective is from the perspective of accounting. But I've said that before we even talk of accounting, the contract must be intact. You understand? Exactly. There must be a contract. And it is the terms and condition of that contract that influence the manner to which we account for this. OK. OK, and the last one. Uh, I actually want to know the line of differences between uh, IS 17 and IFRS 16, because from the old uh, presentation, I discovered that uh, IA 17 uh, differentiates a lease into operating lease and financed lease, which I think IA 16 silence about the differentiation. IFRS 16. From, sorry, IFRS 16 silence about the DAT classification. Apart from that, do we have any area of differences between IAS 17 and IFRS 16? Okay, let me start from the last question. There are areas of differences, and I've said it earlier at the start of this section, and that is where we are going to finish with, where we must first of all know what 16 says, since we have expectation of what we know before now about 17. 
will now make comparison. And that is that one. Two, with respect to your first question, you said it seems that IFR system was silent about classification. The answer is not, uh, that's, uh, that, uh, uh, that is a misconception from you or from your statements. If you go back to my discussion ab initio at the start of this session, I made note that IFR 16 adopted a single economic model, which more or less do not classify lease from the perspective of the lessee's accountant, but rather every lease will be recognized by way of right of use of assets, okay? But still maintain the classification into finance and operating lease from the perspective of the lessor's accounting, the container, which means there's no nothing silent about, is a change of model from two model to a single economic model, very simple. Thank you. Please, I have a question, sir. Yes. Okay, I want to know if um, IFRS 16 applies to uh, sharing platforms. You know, there's a new uh, business model, you know, that is related to circular economy that allows uh, people to get the maximum value from resources. So for instance, maybe I have an asset that I'm not using maximally and there's a platform that will connect me to somebody that is in need of that asset, you know? And sometimes it may pass from one person to another. It may pass for, to like three or four persons before the value of that asset is finally extinguished. So does that, can we say IFRS 16 applies in this scenario? Okay, uh, it's still very simple. The answer to the question is to follow this, this chart. Very simple, okay? And you have to pick situations from situation, instance from instance, okay? Because there are not two things that are the same. Now, what you are simply saying is this. When I cannot make use of full capacity of an asset, Instead of me to waste the idle capacity, and I, I more or less allow another person to make use of it. Okay, it's, which means, remember, when we define uh, a lease, we said it's a contract or a part of a contract. Okay, which means, what matter about it is to ask yourself that is there a specified asset? Okay. Yes, there's a specified asset, which is a part of a platform. Okay. Two, do I have control as a lessee or as a customer over that so that I can direct the use and substantially all of the economic benefit of using that particular part will come to me. And it's of a longer term, not of 12 months. And it's not considered of a low value. When you answer all these questions and it is yes, you understand it becomes a lease. But if the answer in one way or the other is no, it goes off. Okay, radar. so a, a typical example I will cite here is co-working space. Okay, a co-working space will not necessarily qualify. Why? <laughs> Why? Because from the co-working space I know, or what you call a workstation that is shared, there's no asset that is identified or specified. What you're only giving access to is access to come and do anything there. Your seat is not separately identified. Your toilet, all of that is, you know, things within that place are not separately identified. It's more or less of a service contract in its real sense. I will not necessarily agree to the larger extent that most of co-working space would rather be more of a service contract than a lease contract. I think it makes sense, Abby. Okay. 
Yeah, we are welcome back to our discussion. Now, um, let's start with some practical examples or illustrations with respect to our discussion. And at this point, we will switch to our exam model to solving this problem. Okay, let's start with a um, little expression of, um, let me provide some information here. Yeah. Okay. There is a contract that contains a lease with a specified asset being a tractor. The asset is leased for four years under the following terms. Fixed payments, A year two thousand. Okay, um, frequency. Annual time of payment in advance. Initial direct. Twenty thousand um, initial payments. Okay, let me see this for five years. Initial payments. Which was paid at down that's fifty thousand. These incentives received by the lessee. Let me say it's five thousand. Okay, now this more or less represents. Um, the information I require. Okay, and um, let me assume that interest rate implicit in the lease That's five percent per annum. <clears throat> okay, now what we want to determine in this case is for us to determine the following. A, the 
in this liability at the commencement of the lease and at each reporting date up to expiration. Let me just stop there. At each reporting date, B, the right of use assets at the commencement and thereafter. See allocation of the finance charge or interest rates, interest expense over the list term. and presentation of the lease liability into current and long current portion. Okay, now this is what I've extracted out of the um, question uh, or out of the scenario I wanted to point out. Okay, now how do we do this? Let me just try and put it here so that I can be able to link the list down in years. Is five. Okay. Now the first thing I need to do is to determine the lease liability. And I need to ascertain what is my lease payments. What are the lease payments? Step one, that's my lease payment. Each of the years, year one, well, I'll start from year zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Who will tell me why I started from year zero? Who can tell me why I started from year zero? Because payment is in advance. Because of payment in what? Advance, thank you. Okay, what again constitute my lease payment? Interest. 
interest, I mean, finance charge. Yeah. The interest payments. Okay. Now, I would less incentive from my, what's it called? Um, from my right of use assets. Do I have payable payments? In this case, variable payments. Do I have? Okay, let's pick it one by one. I have 50,000 each year with the first paid in advance. And it will be paid in advance up to the one paid at the end of year four, which is in advance at the beginning of year five. There's no variable payment in this case. Now, you discover that this particular one, I will highlight it as not a liability because this was paid in cash. And therefore, my discounting principle applies from year one. Now, this is my lease payments. What is my discount rate? 5%. Okay, my discount factor is the interest rate implicit in the lease, which is at 5%. This one is five years, not. Okay, remember your discount is one plus R. which I can use this. I'll lock it raised to power minus N. Which is one. And I do that for the three years. Therefore, what is my present value? Is a product of the discount factor and the lease payments. Okay, at the end of the day, what do you have as a lease obligation? When is the commencement date? First day of year one. And in that case, I put it in green color. And that's sum up to the sum of all my present values. And that is 177. Okay. 
okay, this is my lease liability as at the beginning. Now this 50,000 was not considered because it can be a liability when I've paid it already in advance. I paid it on the first day of January, year one. And that is not liability because I parted the will with cash. The other payment that is left is the four equal installments, which will be paid at the first day of year two, first day of year three, first day of year four, and first day of year five which means it's only four payment that is left. And the present value of this is what sum up to this. Now, that is that. Second is to determine the lease asset. That is... The right of lease assets. The right of asset. And how do I do that? Now, the right of use assets comprises of one, the lease liability. What is the lease liability? Let me say off it goes in there. The least liability is what we have obtained here. Two is the initial down payment, which was in advance. Remember the first 50,000, I'll put it in yellow and I'll link it with a line. To link it at this 50,000 is what I'm bringing down here as 50,000. Take notes. Now that's the first payment, which is the initial payment you have here. Let me link it to this. And let me link this to this. The other ones are this amount. Because sometimes it might not be the same. It might not be equal. Okay. Now, the third item is the initial direct cost that was incurred on the assets, which might include legal costs, professional costs, valuation, et cetera. And that was this 20 time. And finally, there was lease incentive. That have to be deducted. And that is this fact. At the end of the day, what is the value of the right of use asset? Is the sum of this. Any question on that? Any question? Now, if we are told to present journal entry for this, which is in practice, journal entry. I want to ask, are we not going to uh, factor in the depreciation of the assets? Remember, that's why I said, all what we are doing is at the commencement date. Okay, okay, that's true. Remember, this is lease assets at commencement date. This is lease liability. Okay, sir. Hmm? Okay, sir. Lease assets. Is that not? Yeah. Let me put asset in green. Let me put liability in red. 
Okay. Now, what is the journal entry at the commencement date? Debit and what? Credit. Let me put debit first, which is our practice convention. For the right of use assets, what do you do? Therefore, for the right of use assets, The following are items that are under it. The initial payment. That's the 20,000. Remember, as you have that, that affects your cash. Well, let me see bank balance. Bank. On that bank, I have my initial down payment. What's the corresponding credit? That's the credit to this. Let me put the color there. I have the lease liability. The lease liability is this. I debit it to my right of use. Oh, don't let me call it lease liability, I'll call it present value of lease payments. And I come here, that comes under my lease liability. PV of these payments. Next one that affect that is my initial direct cost. Okay, sorry, this is not 20, this is 50. My initial direct cost is 20. And I also pay that to bank. And if I've not yet paid, it will go to payable. Initial direct cost paid for. What color should I put there? Okay, um, I have incentive. Okay, that incentive, this incentive, I got, receive it in cash. That will reduce my asset value because it's like a way of refund. And that will increase my cash position. Cash in cash leave incentive. Okay. Any other entry? At the end of the day, the sum of my entries is as follows. This is my journal entry. 
okay? But when you net the value of the assets, it is the sum of debit minus credits. Sum of debit is 247. When you minus credits, it comes back to this 242. Why your liability is only 177? Why? You have already paid 70 in cash and you have received cash of five. And that is that. Okay, now we can now proceed to subsequent measurements. At its reporting what yes. Now, software measurement at each reporting date. Okay, let's start with step three. I'll then call that step four after journal entry, step four, depreciation of the right of use assets. And what do you do? Annual depreciation is straight line method. And what do we need? I need the cost. I need the lease term, I need the useful life. Okay. The reason why I need lease term and useful life is, remember the basic principle is that you depreciate over the shorter of the two. But the useful life is unknown in this case, but the lease period is five years. The cost from what we just did is 242,000. Therefore, annual depreciation on a straight line will be this divided by this. And that will give us our answer. That's annual depreciation which means year in, year out, this is the amount recognized as the position. Okay, let's take note of that. Now, which means if you prepare your depreciation schedule, it can show you what the carrying amount is at each period. Now, let me just try to do that. Carrying amount, of right of use at each reporting date. Yeah. Yeah, one, two, three, four, and five. Um, cost to kind amount at start depreciation annual depreciation and kind amount at end.
Now, what is the initial cost? This annual depreciation is fixed, given that we have adopted cost. And my net book value, which is a kind amount. And my book value at the end of year one, at the beginning, at, end, at the beginning of year two. And that is how we do that up to year five. Okay. Now, step five is the allocation of the finance charge. Arising from the measurement of this liability. And this methodology is usually called the actuarial, which is synonymous to the amortized cost measurement. And it is a scientific measure. Okay, and we're going to see that now. Now I can construct a simple amortized cost cost uh, schedule. Um, yeah. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Balance at start. Interest at the interest rate implicit in the list, 5%. Lease payments. And um, balance at the end. Okay. Now the balance at the start in this case of year one is the value we obtained earlier on, which was this. Now the interest is a product of this 5%, which is fixed. I'll lock it and this balance. And again, Towards the end of year one, which is the beginning of year two, the sum of 
50,000 will have been paid, which is the annual per year. Since it's paid in advance, what is left is 136 at the beginning of year two. And I replicate this. And this payment ends in year four. I didn't lock it. This payment ends in year four because you will have paid a year in advance of the final year. And therefore, I construct. At the end of the day, by end of year four, which is beginning of year five, I won't have been owing because I've paid in advance, remember? In advance. It's critical to know. Which means in each year, the entire finance cost has been allocated using actuarial method, synonymous to effective interest rate method, the sum of this. which is my total finance cost. Okay. At the end of the day, the payment I've made in full is the first initial payment and subsequent annual payment. And everything I've paid is 250. And that is it. And what is the entry you passed here? Your journal entry, similar to what I've done here. Let me call this step three. Journal entry. That should be my step six. My journal entry is to recognize one finance charge. Each year. Now I can make this year one. And I'll call this debit my finance charge in my profit or loss. And the corresponding entry is to credit my lease liability. My lease liability will be increased in each year, in year one by this. Now, by year two, it is six. Year three, it is four. And year four, it is two. These are the entries I'm going to pass each year. In year five, it is nil. Why is it nil? Because I no longer have obligation to which interest is payable. Okay. That is that. 
Step seven. Okay, before step seven, this is finance charge. Lease payment. I credit my lease liability for every payment I make. And I credit my bank. My liability is extinguished for the 50,000 I paid in year one. And this is what I do for the next three years. The second amount, the third amount, and the last amount. That is that. Now, step seven. is to separate into current and non-current. Split of lease liability. into foreign and non-foreign. How do we split? Splitting of this is very simple, okay? My Naira value of the lease obligation is obtained. This liability at each year end. Now each year end, Year one, to year five. Now, the least liability for each of those years, we have it here. The least liability will be, please be watchful. Because not immediately at the year end was it paid. It was paid a day after the year end, which is first of the night. Therefore, what it means is that the sum of the liability before, uh, the liability after interest has been accounted for, but before lease payment is made, which means it is 177 plus eight to give this. Okay. And this is the liability. Now, now at any point in time, we less current portion. Current portion due is the one due immediately the next day or within one year, which is 
the portion that is payable in advance at every period. And what is that? It is this 50. And at the end of the day, if this is the current portion, what you have left is the non-current portion, which is the non-current liability. And what I've done is that this 136 is synonymous to this 136 because that represents the non-current portion. What I will now do for you is to expand on that and try to do modify the table for you. Now the balance you have here is what you repeat for the second year. Also, 50,000 was paid day after. And that's 92, which is the non current portion. Third year, Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Please, I still don't understand this uh, one day before and day after this. Okay, I'm coming yeah. to show There's you a now. Portion. Yeah. yeah, I'm coming to show you again. Okay. Remember, as of thirty first December this year, okay. what is current portion is what is payable between the one and the next twelve months. Yes. And what is due within the one next twelve month is the next fifty thousand that is due the next day in advance. Mm -hmm. That's true. Because the next fifty thousand after the next day is more than twelve months, even if it's more than one day, uh, twelve months more than a day. Do you get what I'm saying now? Yeah. And I'm going to show you. You'll see it. Now, for year four. The liability is 50, but immediately in the next one day, the 50 is due, which is the current portion. And no longer liability, no more liability, no more non current portion because the, uh, the current portion is already immediately paid and nothing is left as at year five. I understand now. Okay, now this is how we split when it comes to payment in advance which means the current portion is always the next advance payment payable in the next one day. Yeah. Now, that will not make me to modify this schedule for you, for your better understanding. I'll modify the schedule by saying, okay, I will bring something in between this to make it easier. I'll call this balance at the end. Current, uh, sorry, total. Do you get what I'm saying now? I'll create this for you. Which means the sum of this is the actual balance. Because there is no payment due in this year again, because you have already paid 150000 on the first day. Mm -hmm. 
Now, this portion is the non current portion. I'll call this balance, non current. Does that make sense now? Yes, sir. Does that make sense now? Yes, sir. This is the normal balance, and this is the non-current non portion balance. Does that make sense? Because this is usually paid in what? In advance. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, now this explains everything to us. The first thing is to determine the lease payments, those that are paid in cash, this is paid in cash, and those that are paid in cash subsequently. This is paid down, the initial pay down, and these are the subsequent payments. This will be out of the scope for discounting, because it's already paid. Okay. Out of scope for discounting, as it is already what? Paid. Okay, the lease liability will serve as the first input to determine the lease assets plus other items, less lease incentive. And from there, we're able to determine our lease asset at commencement date. And the journal entry that supports such recognition is as shown here, where the right of use of assets is as a result of addition I'm emanating from the initial payment, the present value of lease payment, the indirect cost incurred by the lessee, less lease incentive gotten from the lessor. And our bank balance is depleted by the initial payment we paid and the direct cost we incurred in cash and is increased by the cash incentive we receive. Okay. And um, our lease liability is as determined from the present value of the lease payments. Does that make sense? Okay, now from there, we went further to say, okay, what happened to the lease assets? Since we carry that cost, we subject it to depreciation over the shorter of the lease term and the useful life. But because the useful life is not known, shorter, of which means in the real sense you pick the lower of these two if this is four we'll depreciate over four if this is seven we'll depreciate over five okay and that's how we have this annual depreciation and this annual depreciation is what brought about a debit to profit or loss. That's the position and a credit to the right of use assets.
Does that make sense now? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, and that is what brought about this. Now, the finance charge is the time using these actuarial methods synonymous to what we have done before now under financial instruments, okay? And therefore we have our balances with determine interest on it and we determine the balance, which is both current and non-current portion. The word total here is current and non-current portion, okay? Take note of that. Let me highlight it in red as a way of emphasizing on it. And these two in advance in red, because it's always abnormal to pay in advance. It's always in areas in some cases, most cases, and this is not quite portion only. Okay, let's take note of that. Okay, and the donor entry is to recognize the interest, which is the finance charge. You debit your profit or loss as an expense and credit your liability to increase it. And upon this payment, you debit your liability to deplete it and you credit your bank to deplete your cash position. Yeah. And that is that. And similar to what I've done in this credit, it's still what I've done here to split this list liability into current portion and non current portion. Okay. That is that. Any other question? So I just want to add that in practice, I think it's this last step that goes into the notes to the financial statement. This step yeah. seven. No, this step seven also is reflected in the balance sheet. That's why when you check a typical balance sheet, you see list obligation on that current and non current liability. But when you sum the two together, is what make up this total balance of this total list balance. Do you get what I'm saying now? Yes, sir. Okay, the same question. I'll call this scenario one. I will replicate it for scenario B. We'll see what I will change and how that might uh, uh, technically change our solution. Now scenario two. What is only changing in scenario two is this. It's no longer advanced. It is now in areas. And which means initial payment was not made. No initial what? Payment. Therefore, there's no initial payment. This is not there. There's no initial payment. Therefore, this is off, off, no initial payment. Now, therefore, it means we have year five. It means we extend this to year five. All of this will be extended to year five. Now, what then happens? It's for us to sum up the old present value to these dates. It means it's 216. There's no initial payment. Do you get what I'm saying now? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, each is paid at the end of each year. Year one, year two, year three, year four. No initial payment. This is off. Which means our liability will increase by the present value of that additional one payment that will have paid in advance that we are paying in areas. And that is that. 
Now, which means there's no initial payment in this case, this is nil nil. Because there's no what? Initial payment. And this is our new position. And that also impact on the lease what? Assets. Because finance cost is an integral part of the cost of an asset. If you follow the principle of borrowing cost yeah. in its principle. Okay, and that is that. Now, invariably, what has happened? What has happened is that our asset will still be depreciated in this light. Okay, and it is now 46,000 based on this cost value. And this is it. And the beauty of model is that you don't need to repeat your step all over, all over, all over again. You can say now. And that is how we obtain the current amount. Now, what will now have a twist is our liability because this issue of this current portion will no longer be required. And therefore, I can take this off, return this, and let us see how it moves. Now, it's no longer in advance. I will change it. It's in what? Areas. And let me change it to the color I have here. Is in areas. Now, this is the both current portion and non current portion. Okay. Now, let us look at the liability. The liability at the start was this amount. Okay. Interest is at that rate. First principal was paid year one. Second one, year two. Third one, year three. Fourth one, year four, and last one, the end of year five. Now, what is my balance? My balance is the sum of my opening balance plus interest less my lease payments. And that is that. And by the time I do that, for everyone, I sum it up. And this gives me my new position. My entire finance cost is 33,000, which I have to amortize over a five year period using the actuarial methodology, synonymous to effective interest method. And at the end of the day, this is my interest recognition, and likewise my payment of the obligation as I defray Now, Year five comes to play. I made payment in year five, unlike the former one, that the payment stopped at the beginning of year five, which was end of year four. Now, now see how we split current and non current portion. Now, the way you split current and non current portion is this first, these are all my liabilities. Well, let me pick it from the schedule. This is year one. Year two. Year three. Year four. Year four and year five. Now, let me tell you something. The current portion 
is always the difference between this year liability and next year liability. Therefore, this is the current portion, 41, which means at every point in time, your current portion is the difference, I can do it from here, different between your estimated lease liability this year and your <laughs> estimated lease liability next, next year. year. Now, the non-current portion will be the balance between this and this. Which means I'll put here, this is the balancing what figure. I'll put it in red. And that is what I would do up to year four. By the time I get to year four, there's nothing due for more than one year. It's what is due immediately. And therefore, none is left here. And this is how I split my current portion from my non current portion. Does that make sense? Yes. Is it interesting now? Yeah, very, very, very interesting. Any other question? Let me try and express this. This is the difference between year N and year N plus one. I'll try and do that for you. Okay, I have a question, sir. Okay, I'm coming, sir. Okay. Okay, have you seen the symbol now? The difference between year N and year N plus one, which means difference between year one and year two, or year two and year three, year three and year four, year four and year five. Okay, what's your question? Okay, my question is that, you know, for instance, if I'm working in an organization now that has multiple or several lease arrangements, you know, I believe that, you know, I will not have to go uh, through this process for each of those uh, lease contracts. So can you just give me a hint? I'm not saying you, you really have to do it here, but can you give me an idea of how to like, a model that I can use to uh, to calculate each of those arrangements without having to do them separately in this way. Okay, uh, you have to do them separately. But remember that we have said that they are of material value. If they are of low value, we even go through all of these metrics. Okay, I understand. You know, for instance, if you are trying to uh, if you are trying to compute depreciation and uh, accumulated depreciation for PPE, you know, there's a model that we normally use that capture everything at once so that we don't really have to be doing each of those assets separately. You understand? You understand what I'm trying to say now? I'm not saying we should aggregate, but how can we present a model that we don't really need to take each asset one at a time? Yeah. Uh, that's what we're saying. You can design any program that what you just need to plug are your parameters. Yes, exactly. That is what and the mean. variables will just be plugged in and it will compute. You can design it. But again, it's still the fundamental of once you do one, you now replicate it for others so that what you just need is to have an input sheet. And automatically, by way of macros and other things, it will automatically populate your result for you. 
Do you get it? Yes, I understand. And also, if we have a robust software that is IFRS compliant, that has a processing engine, you can also do this. Uh, uh, this requirement can be met through such application. But it's something you can easily do on spreadsheet also. Okay. Subject to modification and some other things. At the time you enter into a list, you can always do it at once. And every posting will have been logged on the system so that at each period, you just release it. It's only where there is now modification to the lease contract, or there's a need to measure the liability where we we'll get to that level with respect to variable payments. That's only when changes will be adopted, but you can predetermine what it is. It's like asset depreciated. You plug it on once, it's only when you value the asset or you impair it that you can recompute it again on the system. But otherwise, all things being equal, you know how it's going to spread the cost throughout the useful life. In this case, throughout the lease period. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Any question? Any question? Okay, let me give you this practice question. Let me, I'll share this with you and I want you to do your own. But before then, let me allow you to read the question out for us. And um, you do yours. I'll give you a few minutes to deliberate on it. And you model it out. I will model it to do it tomorrow. No, I'll send you this model now and you model it immediately. Check your WhatsApp. I'm sending it to your WhatsApp. Can somebody read this question? Company, company A makes up its accounts to 31st December each year. It enters into a lease as a leasee to lease an item of equipment with the following terms. Inception of lease, 1st January 20X1. Time, five, year, five years, $2,000 paid at commencement of lease followed by four payments of $2,000 <clears throat> payable at the start of each subsequent year. Pay value, $8,000. Present value of future lease payments, $6,075. Useful life, eight years. Interest rates implicit in the lease, 12% required. Show how should this lease Show how this list should be accounted for in Company A, A's statement of financial position as at 31st December 20X1. Okay. Okay. Um, can somebody present for you guys and let us see how it goes? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Shabu. Thank you very much. Based on the question, we have a fixed payment of $2,000 per annum. The frequency is annual and uh, it's a payment in advance. And uh, initial direct cost is uh, zero. We don't have any initial direct cost. We have initial payment of $2,000. The implicit rate of interest is our uh, 12% and the list term is our uh, five years. So, um, Based on the model you gave us, the step one will no longer be uh, relevant uh, simply because we have been provided with the uh, lease liability. So we move straight to step two. That is where we have the lease liability of 6,000. Okay, hold on, and, hold on, sorry. Uh, Even step one, you still go ahead to do it, which shows that you got the same answer. Is that not what you've done? Uh, actually, we did not. Uh, I think 
it's just that it filled automatically. Yeah, it's still the same thing. Like whether you use it or not, this is also a proof that the model yeah, gave you exactly the what the was. value was. But again, in yes. examination condition, you need not repeat what has been given to you. But for practical understanding, mm -hmm. this step is, seems to have been repeated and which also justify that you are on track. Okay, continue. Yeah, okay, thank you. So by, you know, imputing relevant uh, figures, we arrive at the least assets on commencement. That's like the costs of the, of the least asset on commencement. And then we move to the uh, step three, which is a journal entry. We debit the initial payment and the present value of lease payments. And uh, we credit the mode of payment, which is uh, bank uh, with the initial payment. And also the uh, lease, we also credit the lease liability by 6,075. So from there, we move to the next step, which is a step four. This is where we computed our uh, depreciation on the right of use asset. You know, we already computed the cost to be 8,075 years, so we brought it here. So uh, in arriving at, uh, 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 we have to choose either the least term or the useful life, the shorter of the two, but we realize that the least term is shorter to the useful life of eight years, so we have to depreciate over five years. So and we got the uh, annual depreciation here to be 1,615. So that flows into this model. Into Hold this on, please. Model. Okay. Hold on, please. Thank you. Now click cell T3 again. TA or T3. T3. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to model in future, you don't just select because you want to model you have to model it in such a way that let it recognize that you always have to check these two cells, the least term and the useful life. And you must pick the lower of the two. Therefore, what Excel function will you have used for it to pick the lower of the two or the shorter of the two? Um, in statement. I think it should be an if statement. No, no, you don't need if statement for these two variables or even for three variables. It's a simple variable. If statement is a too much conditional statement. This is not, this is pure binary option. Can you use minimum function? Oh yeah, remove okay. R5, yes. remove R5, remove R5. Oh, yeah, type M-I-N. Open bracket, oh yeah, click that five, which is R4 comma R, R5 comma R6, close it. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, change that eight years to four years and see what will happen. That is the model. Wow. So that you don't need to be cherry picking at every point in time, that is it. Okay, please change the less seat time you put there to lease. This, instead of, L E double S is L E A S E. Change that place. Remove one S. Yeah. Okay, you can continue from there. Okay, so this is the uh, the asset schedule. Then we move to step five, which is how we allocated the finance charge arising from the measurement of the lease liability. So this column here, this column here is. Uh, the carrying amounts, I mean the la, I mean the, the the liability, and this is the interest on it. Then we have the these are this fourth column here represents the, the summation of uh this carrying amount and the interest interest rate, I mean interest portion. So we got the total uh total liability. Then we have to separate this uh, total amount into the uh current liability and non-current liability. So the current liability represents the payment at each uh, year end. So this is a separation, this is where we did it. And here, the step six represents the uh, journal entry for the finance charge and the lease liability at every year end. 
So from there, we move to the last step, which is where we separated the current portion of liability from the non-current portion. And it's something also similar to what we have in uh, step five, but to make it much more presentable, so we've done it this way, following the model you provided for us. So this is a liability at each year end, and we have the, this one here, the one painted in pink, it represents the total liability at each year end. Then we can easily separate the current uh, portion from the non-current current portion. And it's the same thing for, for the five years. Now, there's an aspect of the question you didn't address. And it's not also in your input data. That is the aspect of fair value. If you go back to the question, this fair value, what does this stand for? First, can you go into the question and uh, into your input data and create a session for it and explain what is the relevance of it? Can you just shift? Okay, you can shift it there. Fair value of the assets. Fair value of lease assets. Write it in full. Fair value of lease assets. Okay, that's 8,000. Okay, what's the relevance of it in the whole scheme of arrangement? So please, team members, we can also contribute on. <laughs> okay, let me uh, let me give you guidance. The relevance of it for short is that in case you are not given the interest rates implicit in the lease, and you are only given the fair value of the assets, with this other information from the fair value of the lease asset, you can determine the interest rate implicit in the lease. Let me share this again to us because we we'll discuss it today. Now, how do we determine interest rate implicit in the lease? I said interest rate implicit in the lease is the internal rate of return or the rate or the discount rate that approximates or equalize the present value of the lease payment and the present value of the unguaranteed residual value to equal the fair value of the specified asset and the initial direct cost. Now, in this question you have, let me just open one Excel. In this question you have, what is our lease payment? Our lease payment is made up of each year. Year one, year two, year three, year four, and year five. Let me share that screen. Year five. Okay, now, there is no variable payment. The only payment we have is a fixed payment. Okay, if that is the case, the only payment we have is the fixed payment. Now, if that is the case, what is it? Is two thousand dollars. Starting because it's in advance, I'll start from zero, one, two, three, four. The total amount in absolute time is ten thousand dollars. Okay, let me just use Naya. 
for simplicity sake. Now, this is our lease payments. Now, do we have residual value? Unguaranteed residual value? No. Unguaranteed residual value? No, we don't have. Yeah. We don't have, okay. I'll put it zero. That's zero, which means the total now. Total. Let me sum it together. Remember, this payment comprises of fixed payment, variable payment, and etc. Now, what is my discount factor? At a rate that is unknown. And that rate is the interest rate implicit in the lease. Okay. Now I don't know what it is. And therefore, that will produce my present value. And my present value is a product of my total value and my discount. Now, what is the interest rate implicit in the list? The interest rate implicit in a list is the discount rate that equates the PV of the sum of lease payments and unguaranteed residual value. To the sum of the fair value of the assets and the initial direct cost. In this case, In this case, what is the fair value? The fair value of the least assets is how much? The fair value is 8,000. Plus, the initial direct cost, which in this case is zero. Therefore, the sum of this is 8,000.
Now we are looking for what? A rate. That rate. So that if we put it here, let me say it's zero percent, for example. The rate is zero percent, for example. So that if I use it at a discount rate, it will make the present value of these cash flows to equal this eight. If you can see it, let me turn on the spotlight. The discount rate, if I'll use it to determine my discount factor, so that the present value here which is sum up here, we equal this 8,000 here. And what I can do is to say, okay, what is my discount factor? One plus R, what is R? This is 0%. I'll lock it, raised to power minus each year. Year one, year two, like that. But the first year here is the zero because of what? There was an advance payment. Okay, followed by subsequent payments. Therefore, upon that, I can expand this. And that seems to give me one or two. Who can tell me why it's one or two? Because I've used this count rate of 0%. I mean, if I put 2%, it's not giving me. 8,000, it's still 9,000. If I use 9% or 8%, it's giving me close to 8,000. If I use 11%, it's giving me close to 8,000, Abby. Now, mm -hmm. what percentage I use? I'll now use go seek. I'll just say, this is for me to go to my data. If you remember what, what we do it on a financial instrument, I come to my what if analysis and I seek a go. I'm changing this cell so that mm -hmm. I influence it with a change of variable to give me this 8,000. Therefore, I want you to give me this 8,000 in principle. I'll write 8,000 there. So that the only thing that can influence it to be 8,000 is this discount rate. Okay. And at the end of the day, it gives me what it is. And let me show you what it is. This is a 12.59%. And probably that's why the examiner just approximate everything to 12 odd percent. But I'm just giving you this in case of future where mm -hmm. you might not have been given the interest rate implicit in the list, but you have sufficient information to determine it. Does that make sense? But if not, okay. if you don't have reasonable information to determine it, you resort to using what? the incremental borrowing rate of the customer, that is of the less. Does that make okay. sense? Okay. Any question on that? Any question, please? I think you should take that again since people are a bit quiet. <laughs> I don't know. It's clear no. to me, but I don't know whether it's clear to no, me. Any question, if there's a question, they should. Okay. Ask. Okay, that is that. Now, um, let me now display what, although you guys completed everything, let me just display what the question demands. The question demands just to show the position at the end of the first year. Okay, even though you guys have successfully showed all of the position to the end of the year. Okay, and that is a nice try. Please, uh, Shegun, uh, you send the stuff to me and I can send it to others. Is that okay? And others can equally still build their own model with the base model that we have given. Therefore, what the answer may be, let me reduce this. If you compare this with what Shegun has done, it's exactly the same answer. 
Can we all compare the note? Chegun, can you compare your note with this? And all of what we have done is just as at the end of the first year. The kind amount of your right of use asset was 6460. Your liability was split into two, current portion 2000, non-current portion 4804. Is that not correct? Yes, right. Shagui, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, is it not correct? Is it not exactly the same thing, John? Yeah, it's the same thing, sir. Yeah, that, is that. that shows you guys have understanding of it. Okay, now let me take you guys to... No, 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 no. Let me take you guys to further discussion on this. Okay, let's go back to our notes. There are critical things that I will now be sharing with you guys based on what we have discussed so far and the practical exercises that we've done. Now, let us look at least incentive. And let us see one or two things that corroborates what we have discussed with respect to this incentive. Okay, I want you guys to read this one by one to corroborate all what we have discussed. And if there's any question for me to buttress more of what we need to understand. Over to you guys. Who will read this for us? Okay, so these incentives are defined as payments made by the lessor to a lessee associated with the lease or the reimbursement or assumption by a lessor of cost of a lease. Just to ask, would this be like um, where the lessor assumes cost of repairs and maintenance? No. Okay. This is a cost you might have incurred. For example, you incur, you are to incur a cost prior to you making use of an asset, which constitute part of your direct cost. And what happened is that the landlord says, okay, I'll refund you part of it. You know, okay. you have your initial cost. Yes. You understand? And landlord is now giving you like a refund of part of it or all of it or whatever based on your agreement. Because it felt that you have augmented the value of the asset. Therefore, let me return something to you. And that might be part of your agreement. To say, okay, you have only provided me this open space. You have not partitioned it. The landlord asks, okay, who are here to partition it to what we have agreed? but I'll refund you so much once you do it. That mm. is, but anyone that relates to subsequent issue of repairs and maintenance, it is treated as a period cost because it's not predetermined in terms of value. Okay, okay. And okay. as we move on, we'll discuss critical things that speaks to that. So does it mean that this list incentive is typically determined at the beginning, like you said? At the, at the, the inception list. of the list. At, at the, the inception. inception. Okay. So such incentives may take the form, for example, of an upfront cash payment to the lessee or a reimbursement or assumption by the lessor of cost of the lessee, e.g. relocation cost and cost associated with pre-existing lease commitment of the lessee. Such payments are offset against lease payments made by the lessee to the lessor. When any incentives are paid to the lessee, even if they are not part of the formal lease agreement, they should be offset against lease payments. Okay. Okay. Now, another thing I speak to you is the variable lease payments, which I classify into two. Those that will form part of the lease payment because they are seen to be of a fixed payment and those that will not be classified but rather treated as a period cost. Okay, and this will substantiate it further. Go ahead. Who will read this for us? Who will read this for us? Okay. Variable lease. 
variable list payments. Yeah. Variable list payments are defined as the portion of payments made by a lessee to a lessor for the rights to use an underlying asset during the lease term that varies because of changes and facts or circumstances occurring after the commencement date other than the passage of time. Variabil variability arises if leases, lease payments are linked to one, price changes due to changes in market rates or the value of an index. For example, lease payments might be adjusted for changes in a benchmark interest rate or a consumer price index. Two, the lessee's performance derived from the underlying assets. For example, a lease of retail property may specify that lease payments are based on a specified percentage of sales made from that property. Three, the use of the underlying assets. For example, a vehicle lease may require the list to make additional list payments if the lessee exceeds a specified mileage. Okay, now you've seen the difference between the variable payment that is related to index, such as consumer price index, such as market rate of return, or market rent, those ones are going to be considered as part of lease payments, but with a clause. The clause is they will be considered based on the value that is placed on it as of today, even though they might likely change in the future. But our estimation of the lease liability today, we only consider the fact known to us today. This board has resolved to say, we are not going to look at a forecast value or forecast transaction. We rather look at the actual value today. Now, the question then is, actual value today will be used to determine the present value of the lease obligation. But what if in the future, the index changes and the rate moves up or down? That will now lead to what we call a measurement of lease liability. And we're going to demonstrate that. Which means lease liability can be measured such that any value emanating from such measurement, especially as it increase the liability, will be used to adjust the right of use asset upward and also to increase the liability. And we're going to see that as time goes on. Take note of that. Now, variable payment that are not incidental to any index or market rent but they are attributed to the fact that certain basis have been adopted, such as a percentage of your revenue as it increases, or as a result of the fact that you are using beyond the agreed capacity of the assets, probably it is agreed that the mileage you can use in a car should not be more than 5,000 kilometers in a month. That anytime you use more than 5,000 kilometers in a month, it affects the wear and tear of the car, in that case, you pay additional. Those ones are what we call contingent rates. And in that regard, such will not constitute part of lease payment. Rather, such will be treated as they occur and be expensed as period cost in each year as such variation comes into play. And that is the position with respect to variable payment. And we're going to see practice questions on that. Any question on that before I proceed? Now let's look at example of variable payment that is based on index or market rent. Sorry. I think I'm doing something wrong. And it might shut down the word documents. 
Okay, can we look at this variable payment that depends on index or rate? Can somebody read it for us? Variable, variable lease payment that depends on an index or a rate. Lease liability initially measured using the index or rate as as at the commencement date. Variable lease payment that depends on an index or a rate, which as indicated at 7.1 should be included within the lease payments. Include, for example, payments linked to a consumer price index, payments linked to a benchmark interest rate, such as LIBOR, or payments that vary to reflect changes in market rental rates. When measuring a lease, lessee's lease liability or a lessor's net investment in a lease, such payments should initially be measured using the index or rates as at the commencement date. Variable lease payments that depends on an index or a rate are included in lease payments. They meet the definition of liabilities for the lessee because they are unavoidable and do not depend on any future activities of the lessee. Any uncertainty, therefore, relates to the measurements of the liability that arises from those payments and not to the existence of that liability. At initial recognition, such payments are measured using the index or rate at the commencement date without estimating changes in the index or rate over the remainder of the lease term. The board considered that using forecasting techniques or forward rates to estimate changes in the index or rates would be costly and might introduce measurement uncertainty and reduce comparability between entities. Okay, you see the reason why you don't forecast. Use what you have today as if that is what will be forever. But the question then is, two years time, it has changed. You go back and you measure your liability and the increase that results into that liability will be used to increase the right of use assets upward and also to increase the liability upward. And you start to depreciate the right of use asset again as if there's a revaluation upward on our asset and you will measure your liability and your finance charge based on the new value. And we're going to see that as we move on. What if the variable lease payment is not dependent on an index or a rate? but it is a function of changes in the consumption or in other parameters that are not market-based. What will have happened in that case? Can somebody read this for us? Measurement of list no, start from this, yeah. this. Start from the heading. Measurement of list liability. Oh, start from when the heading. Variable list okay. payment. Variable lease payment that change by reference to the charge in an index over a specified period. Measurements of lease liability when lease payments change by reference to the change in an index or a rate over a specified period. Example, which is reproduced from the illustrative examples accompanying IFRS 16 illustrates how a lease account, for example, for variable lease payment that depends on an index. In this case, the consumer price index, CPI, the lease enters into a lessee, in, the lessee enters into a lease under which the annual lease payments are scheduled to increase two years after the commencement date and every two years for the remainder of the list term, based on the increase in CPI in the 24 months preceding that fixed remeasurement date. The lessee initially measured the lease 
liability on the assumption that CPI remains constant for the lease term and consequently that the lease payments will not change on future measurement dates. Future changes in CPI are not forecast and IFRS of 10 does not permit the rates of increase for a similar period up to the date of the commencement to be used to reflect expected increase in future. On the first measurement and subsequent dates, if the CPI has increased over the preceding 24 months so that there is a known change in cash flows, the lessee remains the liability to reflect the revised future cash flow for the remainder of the list again assuming that there are no further changes in CPI. Exactly. What means is until it happens, you remeasure your lease liability in order to increase the right of use asset by the difference and also increase your lease liability by the same difference and move forward as if there won't be any change again. And if there's another change after some period of time, you do the same thing up to the end of the lease term. Now, that is based on the fact that the variable payment is still based on index or rate, but what happens when there's a change? And that's what we have answered. Any question before I move further? In the absence of that, what if the variable payment is referenced to changes in an index over a variable period of time by referencing a change? Can somebody read this? And let us see a practical example of it. What we have just discussed, let us see a practical example of that. Can somebody read this? Okay. Variable lease payments that change by reference to the change in an index over a specified period. Let's see, enters into a 10 year lease of property with annual lease payments of. 50,000 CU payable at the beginning of each year. The contract specifies that lease payments will increase every two years on the basis of the increase in the consumer price index for the preceding 24 months. The consumer price index at the commencement date is 125. 125. This example ignores any initial direct costs. The rate implicit in the lease is not readily determinable. Lessee's incremental borrowing rate is 5% per annum, which reflects the fixed rate at which lessees could borrow an amount similar to the value of the right of use of assets in the same currency for a 10 years term and with similar collateral. At the commencement date, lessee makes the lease payment for the first year and measures the lessee the lease liability at the present value of the remaining nine payments of 50,000 sales. Discounted at the interest rate of 5% per annum, which is three on, 355,391 CEO. Now, what this has told us is that if you use the same model we have developed to construct solutions to this problem, what you will have gotten, having taken into consideration one, that the lease payment is 50,000, but one is paid in advance of each year, which means one is already in cash, while the other nine is deferred. In that case, that will be taken into consideration in measuring what the liability is. And that is number one. Number two is that what will you use as your discount rate when you have no sufficient information to determine your interest rate implicit in a lease? Therefore, it means you now have to defer to the incremental borrowing rate of the lessee. Okay, and that is that. Okay, and what determines your incremental borrowing rate is based on similar circumstances in terms of assets, in terms of tenor, in terms of conditions, and in terms of currency that is bound by that transaction. 
Okay, now let's see what it looks like, given that we have carried out the measurement, but I'll give you a tax where you guys will go on your own to model it out, even though you have the results before you. But what I want you to first of all understand is the underlying principle, and we can go back and analyze the model we have developed to answer the question. Now, let's look at it from this perspective first. Now, the lease initially recognized an asset and liability in relation to the requirement of FI 16. The right of use asset is this amount. Okay, how does this amount differ from the initial liability? If you remember, go back to the model we constructed. You find out that the lease asset is beyond the lease liability. Because the lease liability plus other things such as initial direct cost, initial payment, and less of incentives will factor in. And that is why you find out that the lease liability plus the initial pay down is what culminated to your lease asset. If you go back to the journal we did earlier, let me share the journal again. Um, where's our Excel sheet? Remember the journal we did under scenario one. Oh, God. This is the journal. Can you reflect on the journal? Okay. That's the journal once again, so that you can reflect on it. What kind of entry do you pass in that situation? Okay. Furthermore, least expected to consume the right of the use of asset, which is a future economic benefit over the least time and thus be depreciated on a straight line. Remember, this amount is to be depreciated on a straight line. Remember that two years is what we are considering now. And therefore, if you depreciate this over 10 years, it is about 40,000 per year. And for two years, it will be 81,000 in this case. Now, also, your lease expense, remember, if you go back to the amortized cost table, you're able to determine the lease expense that you are going to recognize in order to increase your liability. Okay? And that is that. And further to that, every time you make payment, your payment will deplete or defray your liability and equally deplete your cash position by the amount of the lease payments. Okay, now what now happened is that at the beginning of the third year, before accounting for change in the future lease payment, resulting from the change in consumer price index and making the lease payment for the third year, this sum. Now in the third year, we have to remeasure the lease obligation. Why? Because the index has changed. And as such, the index is no longer using 50 discounted payments. It's now going to be using 54. Why is he using 54? Who can tell me why he's using 54 and not 50? Why is he using 54 and not 50? Who can explain? I think because there is a, there is change. Yeah, in this index is now 135 away from what? 125, which means you now have to index up, which means index here is that you are accounting for inflation, which means the inflation must be compensated for from the angle of the lessor. And the lessor is saying that it's no longer collecting 50 because it has been pre-agreed. It's now collecting 54 because of that duration. Now, what now happened is that remember that two payment has gone out of 10 payments. Therefore, it means that what is left is what? Eight payments, which means 54 will be paid eight times to the end of the expiration. Now, when you now find the present value of that, that present value 
is what you now compare. The new present value is now this, based on the eight payments. And the difference between this and this is what gives you 27,145, which is the remeasurement value. that you now have to use to increase your right of use asset as if you are evaluating it upward and increase your what? Your liability. Does that make sense? What that means that your depreciation will not change because it's like you have revalued your asset upward. You'll now be having higher depreciation amounts and your lease liability will also change subsequently by way of increase finance charge and increase in the amount of lease payment that will be used to defray the obligation. Does that make sense at all? Yes, it makes sense. Sir. Yeah. At the end of the day, the amount you'll be paying going forward to defray your liability will be 54 as opposed to 50. It's no longer 50. 50 only occurred twice. Why going forward, it will be 54. And this 54 will also be assumed to remain fixed for the next eight years until we have evidence that it has changed and it has triggered us to pay higher amount again. You will measure up to the end of the day. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, any other question? Any other question? Uh, sorry, my question is somehow different from this. I, I actually want to know how to get CP height. I, I mean the, the monthly CP height. Is there any site? that is designed to get those information? Yes, you go to the Nigeria Bureau of Statistics. That's for Nigeria. OK. You go there to their website, National Bureau of Statistics. You see it there. OK? OK. But this is just one index. It will be indexed on any market metrics or market factors or indices. Okay, now let's see situation where you are faced with multiple, a single lease is faced with multiple index. How do we do that? How do we treat such situation that it's not just one index, but at least? two or more. Okay, who will read this for us? Okay, so it's variable list payments that are the multiple of an index. So variable list payments that are multiple of an index, an example. Entity A, the lessee, enters into a lease under which annual lease payments are calculated as 100 for you multiplied by a commodity price as at 1st January of each year during the lease term. So lease is paid in advance. At the commencement date, 1st January 2010, commodity price is 1025. Applying the requirements of IFRS 16. Entity A initially measures the lease liability, assuming that the commodity price will not change for the duration of the lease, and consequently, that annual lease payments are constant at 100 to 500, which is 100 times 1025 each year throughout the lease term. On 1st January each subsequent year, when there is a known change in cash flows based on the commodity price at that date. Entity A measures the liability to reflect the revised future cash flows for the remainder of the lease, which I again assume to remain at new, at the new constant amount. Therefore, if the commodity price at 1st January 20, 
2001 is 1035. The lease liabilities are calculated assuming that the lease payments for the remainder of the lease term remain constant at 103500. That's the 100 times 1035. Okay, now what it means is that the same principle applies. The only difference in this case is that instead of you indexing your base case, you are rather using a multiple of an index to determine your variable payment. Okay, but the same methodology apply in that situation. Now let's look at this situation again, another situation that might come across in practice. Okay, can somebody read this up for us? Okay, rent reviews to market rates or upward reviews only. When a lease contract includes the potential for rent reviews, whether to market rates or upwards only, the lease payments included in the measurement of the lessee's lease liability and the lessor's net investment in the lease at the commencement date will be the payment agreed at inception without consideration of future rent reviews. The Whether it thing, specifies... Hold on, the same thing we measure, hold on, please. The same thing we, we, we discuss with respect to the market index or to CPI, where the board, which is the ISB, refuted the use of forecast transactions, forward rate and all sorts of things because it could lead to a lot of measurement of certainties. The same thing applies here. Which means even if your landlord has agreed that periodically I can increase that rent on the lease that is pre-agreed, you are not going to consider future expectation at the inception of the lease or at the commencement. Rather, you are going to use what it is as at that point. And when there's a rate change, you will now do a measurement adjustment similar to what we have done under the market index. Can you continue? Whether a lease specifies a rent of 100 annually plus market increases or 100 annually with setting up or down to market every five years, the lease payment recognized at the commencement date are 100 annually. Any increase or decrease as a result of subsequent rent reviews will be recognized when the adjustment to the lease payment takes effect. The basis of an, any rent review under a lease should be evaluated carefully to determine whether the rent review resets the lease payment to market at the date of the review or whether in substance, the amount of change in the lease payment at the date of the review was fixed at inception. In the latter case, the changes in rent would represent in subsequent, in substance, in the latter case, the changes in rent would represent in substance fixed payments and would therefore be included in lease payments from the commencement date. For example, when TTC, the lessee, enters into a lease of a building under which the renters are initially set at market rates, but with a contractual requirement to reset the rentals to the market rates at five year intervals throughout the lease term. Applying the requirements of IFRS 16, Entity C initially measures the lease liability based on the rentals as at the commencement date. Changes resulting from future rent reviews are not forecast. At each subsequent rent review, the Entity C measures the lease liability to reflect the revised rental payment, determined based on market rates at that date. Again, assuming that those rentals remain constant for the remainder of the lease term. Okay, that is it. Now, Let's now have a shift in paradigm to where more likely the variable payment is not related to any index, neither is it related to market rate or market rent. Now it's related to future performance of the underlying asset or to revenue to which that asset generates. Okay, can you take us to this?
Nuruddin, can you read this for us? Variable lease payments linked to future performance or use of an underlying asset. Variable lease payments linked to future performance or use of an underlying asset are excluded from the measurement of lease liabilities. For a discussion of the board consideration in this regard, such payments are required to be recognized in profit or loss in the period in which the event or condition that triggers those payments occurs. Example, which is reproduced from the illustrative examples accompanied by verse 16, illustrates how a lessee account for variable lease payments not included in the measurement of the lease liability. For, for an illustration of the appropriate treatment for variable lease payments based on usage debt and inception are expected to be paid. Now, let me give you a practical illustration to that, which I've mentioned earlier, which also has been referenced here, is this. Can you move on with it? Okay, variable lease payment based on usage that are expected to be paid. Example, entity Y leases a judge of a fixed non-cancellable term of five years at a rental cost of 100,000 CU per annum payable at the end of each year. If at the end of the five-year period, the mileage of the judge exceeds 50,000 miles, Entity Y will be required to pay the lessor an additional two CU for every mile in excess of 50,000 miles. And in, at inception of the lease, Entity Y expects the mileage at the end of the five year period to be 55,000 55, miles. Entity Y should rec recognize the 10,000 CU that is expected to be payable at the end of five years for the mileage in excess of the 50,000 limits and profit or loss at the additional mile, as the additional miles are sale, with no liability recognized until the until the 50,000 mileage limit in ex is exceeded. Although Entity Y expects at inception of the lease to sell the judge for more than 50,000 miles. Continue. And as a result, no, as a result, to incur additional rentals. Any payments above the 100,000 CU per annum minimum are entirely variable and are not therefore in substance fixed payments as described in IFRS 16. As a result, the least liability recognized at inception will be based on the fixed payments of 100,000 CEO per annum with any additional variable payments based on mileage, i.e. usage of the list, list assets, recognized in profit or loss, or if appropriate, capitalized as part of the cost of other assets in accordance with other relevant IFRS standards in the period in which the event or condition that triggers those payments occur in accordance with IFRS 16. Okay, thank you. And what it simply means is that any increment associated with you uh, going beyond the capacity agreed in terms of mileage or what it may be, or in terms of its utilization, give rise to incremental or variable payment regarding the lease. Such will be treated as an expense as they or call 
rather than as a measurement adjustment to the lease because it is not based on the index, neither is it based on the market rates. Similarly, let us look at the one that is based on sales or performance of the assets. Okay, variable lease payments linked to sales. Assuming the same fact as example 7.5, except that lessee is also required to make variable lease payment for each year of the lease, which are determined as 1% of lessee's sales generated from the leased property. At the commencement date, lessee measures the right of use, use asset and the least liability recognized at the same amount as in example seven. This is because the additional variable lease payments are linked to future sales and thus do not meet the definition of lease payments. Consequently, those payments are not included in the measurement of the assets and liability. Rights of use assets. $405,391. Least liability, $355,391. Lease payments of the first year, 50,000. Lessee prefers financial statements of an annual, on an annual basis. During the first year of the lease, Lessee generates sales of 800,000 CEO from the leased property. Lessee incurs an additional expense related to the lease of 8,000 CU. Okay, 800,000 multiplied by 1%, which lessee recognize and profit or loss in the first year of the lease. Okay, that is that. Which means any changes arising from increase in revenue associated with the asset that would not lead to increase in lease payment would rather be treated as an expense or a period cost rather than treating it as a measurement of the lease liability. Okay, that is that. Any questions so far or any further contribution so far? Now let's look at this critical thing. I discussed at the start of our session. Okay, um, Steve, are you there? And now, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Can you please do your question to this on our behalf? Over to you. Ten minutes. Oh, okay. Um, options to purchase the underlying assets. Purchase options are required to be included in the measurement. You think there's of... a nice as your background? Yes, yeah, there is. Uh, Let me. Uh, if you can take the mask, I think somebody else might take that position. Okay. Yeah. Options to purchase the underlying asset. Purchase options are required to be included in the measurements of a lessee's lease liability and a lessor's lease receivables in the same way as option to extend the terms of a lease. I hear the exercise price of a purchase of option is included in the measurement of a lease liability receivables if the 
lessee is reasonably certain to exercise that option. The board views the purchase option as effectively the ultimate option to extend the lease term. A lessee that has an option to extend a lease for all of the remaining economic life of the underlying asset is economically. In a similar position to a lessee that has an option to purchase the underlying asset. Residual value guarantees. A residual value guarantee is defined as guarantee made to a lessor by a party or related to the lessor that the value or part of the value of an underlying asset at the end of a lease will be at least a specified amount. For a lessee, lease payments include amounts expected to be payable by the lessee under residual value guarantee, IFRS 16. A lessee should estimate the amount that, is, that it expects to pay to the lessor under a residual value guarantee and include that amount in the measurement of its lease liability. This treatment reflects the fact that payments resulting from a residual value guarantee cannot be avoided by the lessee. The lessee has an unconditional obligation to pay the lessor if the value of the underlying asset moves in a particular way. Accordingly, any uncertainty relating to the payments of a residual value guarantee does not relate to whether the lessee has an obligation. Instead, it relates to the amount that the lessee may have to pay, which can vary in response to movements in the value of the underlying asset. In that respect, Residual value guarantee are similar to variable lease payments that depends on an index or a rate for the lessee, for the lessee IFRS 16. Legal title to the underlying assets. A lessee may obtain legal title to an underlying asset before that legal title is transferred to the lessor and the asset is leased to the lessee. Obtaining legal title does not in itself determine how to account for the transaction, IFRS 16. If the lessee controls or obtain control of the underlying asset before that asset is transferred to the lessor. The transaction is a sale and leaseback transaction accounted by applying IFRS 16, section 98 to 103. IFRS 16. However, it's if the lessee does not obtain control of the un underlying asset before the asset is transferred to the lessor, the transaction is not a sale and lease, lease back transaction. For example, this may be the case if a manufacturer, a lessor, and a lessee negotiate a transaction for the purchase of an asset from the manufacturer by the lessor, which is in turn leased to the lessee. The lessee may obtain legal title to the underlying asset before legal title transfer to the lessor. In this case, if the lessee obtains legal title to the underlying asset but does not obtain control of the asset before it is transferred to the lessor, the transaction is not accounted for as a sale and leaseback transaction but as a lease, IFRS 16. You are a monster. Okay, thank you very much. These are salient things that accompany all what we have been discussing earlier on, and we need to take them seriously. Now, part of it is what 
will look at with respect to incremental borrowing. What if your incremental borrowing is in foreign currency? Okay, how do we go about it? Given that your lease might probably be at your local currency or even in foreign currency, what do you do in that regard? Over to you. Determination of incremental borrowing rates, foreign currency. When the list is denominated in a foreign currency, the lessee's incremental borrowing rate should be the rate at which the lessee could obtain funding for the assets in the foreign currency. Determination of incremental borrowing rate. Now, what that means, hold on. Yeah, just wait. What that signifies is a list denominated in dollar when your own functional currency is Naira, we equally obtain the incremental borrowing rate in dollars, assuming you borrow in dollar to buy such an asset under similar account and condition. Whereas all your measurement of the lease will also be done in its functional currency, which is dollar for that transaction. It is after the measurement that you now have to translate into your local currency for you to report the Naira leg of the transaction, and that's what it means. Okay, continue. Dissemination of incremental borrowing rate, use of work is not appropriate. An entity's weighted average cost of capital work is not a suitable basis for estimating the lessee's incremental borrowing rate. Work is a general funding rate reflecting both an entity's cost of equity and its cost of debt. While a lessee's incremental borrowing rate is purely a cost of debt. In addition, the cost of debt used in a typical work calculation reflects the cost of the entity's current borrowings rather than as required by IFRS 16. An incremental rate reflecting the term of the lease, the amount of the lease obligation, and the security over the lease contracts. Okay, now we'll wrap it up with this discussion. Okay, and uh, we'll call it a day, and that will be the end of part one. And in part two, we will start with the contract modification of a lease. Okay, what constitutes a separate contract and what constitutes just an incremental amendment to a contract and a modification that may not require any material adjustment. We'll look at that in part two of this lease arrangement. Furthermore, in part two, we'll look at sales and lease back, how such is accounted for, and what may constitute a sale and lease back, but in its real sense, it is not a sale. It's more or less a, secret, a secretization with respect to borrowing. And we're going to look at that also. And furthermore, we'll now look at the source aspect of the accounting. Remember, all what we have been doing since is with respect to the lessee's aspect of accounting, otherwise known as lessee's accounting for a lease. We'll look at the lessor's accounting vis-a-vis -vis the lessor being just a mere supplier of the assets and look at the situation where the supplier, uh, the lessor is even the manufacturer or dealer of the assets. Okay, we we'll also look at that. And we're going to close it up with the presentation, uh, sorry, with the disclosure requirements at both instances. Okay, to close up today's discussion, okay, we'll look at this and we'll say, a night for it. Over to you. Determination of incremental borrowing rates. Let's see, is a member of a larger group. Subsidiary S, a member of the parent P group, enters into a lease of equipment as lessee and determines that the interest rates implicit in the lease cannot be readily determined. As such, 
the least liability recognized as commencement of the lease is required by IFRS 16 to be measured using the lessee's incremental borrowing rates. The lessee's incremental borrowing rates used to calculate the least liability should in accordance, in accordance with the definition of that term in IFRS 16. It reflects the lessee's borrowing rates with similar security and in a similar economic environment to the lessee's lease contracts. However, 16 states that the rate should take into account the credit standing of the lessee, the nature and the quality of the collateral provided, and the economic environment in which the transaction occurs. In addition, IFR 16 refers to the use of a discount rate that reflects how a contract is priced. It is therefore important to determine whether the lease payments are secured based on the credit worthiness of the individual lessee entity in isolation, or also taking into consideration the credit standing of other entities of the group. If the lease payments are explicitly guaranteed by other entities of the group, then using a group incremental borrowing rate would be appropriate if this has affected the pricing of the lease contracts. Okay, I think it's self-explanatory that if you belong to a member of a group and because of certain guarantee or based on the fact that you are assisted with that group, that may have influenced the pricing of your borrowing or otherwise it will be much more likely that rather than use the entity standalone incremental borrowing rate, it will be more appropriate to use the group incremental borrowing rate. In addition to that, kindly proceed. Kindly proceed. From where you stop, if the subsidiary can you unmute? Can you unmute? If the subsidiary has entered into the lease contract on its own account with no guarantee from other group's entity, it's, it is appropriate to use the individual lessee's borrowing rate. However, in the determination of that individual borrowing rate, consideration should be given to any support that the subsidiary receives from the rest of the group more generally. Such supports may come in the, in the form of, for example, a general guarantee of the subsidiary's liabilities or access to fund from the group's central treasury function. Because the lessee's incremental borrowing rate is as noted in IFRS 16, intended to reflect the pricing of a lease contract rather than the credit worthiness of the reporting entity more generally. The same rate would apply to subsidiary subsidiary S lease contract in both subsidiaries in S individual financial statements and in the consolidated financial statements of the parent P group. Okay, thank you very much. Now that speaks to the fact on all what we've discussed today with respect to um, this. And at this point, if there's any other question, I can put it up. Any other question? Okay, if you remember so far, we started from the perspective of defining the objective of RFI 16. Okay, we look at the main features of a lease from the perspective of the lessee and the lessor define what a lease is and the various features of what con of a contract that contains a lease would we'll define what a contract is we we'll look at what an underlining asset is and we we'll look at practical 
demonstration of identifying whether a lease or whether a contract contains a lease or a lease exists in a contract. And we also move further towards identifying whether there is an hybrid situation where a contract contain a lease and also contain a service contract. And we looked at various examples or scenarios as the case may be. And thereafter, we venture into the lease accounting or the lessees accounting for a lease where a single economic model is in use to determine the right of use of assets, where the liability is measured and serve as an input towards the measurement of the asset in addition to other measurements as it includes the initial direct cost, as it includes the initial payment or down payment, as it includes the lease incentives that is taken as a reduction. And also the exceptions to the single economic model with respect to short-term lease and lease of low values. Okay, and we went further to identifying the difference between the inception and commencement of a lease as commencement of the lease is what is relevant to us with respect to the recognition of a lease liability and the right of use assets. Okay, and we also venture in determining different terminologies, um, starting from right of use of asset lease term, interested in the lease, which was eventually demonstrated as the rate of discount or discount rate or rate of return that approximately discounts the present value sum of the lease payment and unguaranteed residual value and equate it to the fair value of the specified assets and the initial direct cost as incurred. We also went further to describe what lessee's incremental borrowing rate is and what constitutes unguaranteed 